2024 or NDAA is critical to that. This authorizing measure is a core pillar of our national defense policy. It guides our Department of Defense and provides direction on the elements necessary to ensure our warfighters are the best manned, equipped, and trained in the world. This legislation is the culmination of hundreds of hours of work. The efforts put into it are not uh, only defined by an open process, but also one across uh, the aisle. Uh, the NDAA has been enacted into law for more than six decades. I'm confident that this bipartisanship will continue and we'll see the streak extended to 63 consecutive years. Uh, the bill before us is certainly a strong one, with a focus on advancing military readiness and ensuring our men and women in uniform are equipped for all threats. It authorizes $886.3 billion for the defense programs. This delivers an increase of $28 billion over fiscal year 2023, while upholding the parameters outlined in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Importantly, it also includes robust oversight by the House Armed Services Committee. They identified changes that will save Americans more than $40 billion, or 5% of the current spending levels, without sacrificing national security. It's another clear demonstration of the Republican conferences and uh, the Democratic conferences ongoing commitment to America to safeguard our nation and hard-earned tax dollars. H.R. 2670 also takes on the Biden administration's attempts to put politics ahead of national security. It projects moves to indoctrinate our nation's defense with progressive ideology by prohibiting things like critical race theory training and Green New Deal initiatives. The Pentagon should be laser-focused on military readiness and preparedness, not appeasing extreme elements of the far left or the far right. The steps uh, asserting a strong posture forward uh, don't end there. Many key priorities of members of both sides of the aisle are fulfilled. It provides the largest pay raise for our troops in over 20 years, includes authorization for retention bonuses for junior enlisted service members, and invests in military families. It continues the prohibition of taking adverse action against service members who refuse to take the COVID-19 vaccine and provides a path back to service for service members who were discharged for refusing to take the COVID-19 vaccine. This NDAA also delivers measures to counter aggression from the Chinese Communist Party's ongoing adventurism in Asia and the Pacific, increases the oversight of military aid, um, advances investments and tools to counter emerging threats, and bolsters the reliability of our supply chain. All in all, the policies in this bill uh, are combat multipliers that support a ready, capable, and lethal fighting force. I'd like to reiterate the efforts made uh, on behalf of our heroes who keep us safe and secure. House Armed Services Committee produced this measure as part of an open and collaborative process. And all the committee considered 760 amendments during the markup and adopted 731 of them. This process resulted in an overwhelming 58 to 1 vote out of committee. I congratulate both the chair and the ranking member for that achievement. It's my expectation uh, that we will continue this collaborative process as we move this measure toward consideration on the floor. I hope and expect that a large number of amendments reflecting ideas from members on both sides of the aisle will receive full and fair consideration on the floor before this measure moves forward to final passage. I now yield uh, to our ranking member, my very good friend, Mr. McGovern, for any remarks he wishes to make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, I want to welcome our, our two witnesses uh, who, uh, who I know have spent an awful lot of time uh, on this bill along with their staffs, and I appreciate their, their service. Uh, today we're going to consider H.R. 2670, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2024. Uh, and um, and, uh, and uh, to be honest with you, um, I think that we're spending too much, quite frankly, um, on our on, on, on the Pentagon budget. Um, you know, I saw a, a 60 Minutes did an expose a few weeks ago where a former Pentagon official told the world about the ridiculous price gouging uh, that takes place at the Pentagon. He explained how the Pentagon overpays for almost everything. In one example, the Pentagon paid $10,000 for a 
$300 oil switch. Uh, I mean, we're on track for a $1 trillion defense budget, for God's sake, um, and it's going to an agency that probably can't even pass an audit. Um, if, we're, if they're overpaying for an oil switch by $9,700, what the hell do people think uh, we're going to find if we do a real complete audit of the, uh, of the agency? And I, I, I point this out because, you know, we hear a lot about the deficit, um, and, um, and yet we continue to um, write one blank check after another when it comes to the Pentagon budget. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm totally in support of giving our troops a pay raise. I think that's the least we can do. Um, but I worry about the money that's not going to individuals or not going to uh, matters that, quite frankly, are essential to our national security, but monies that are, you know, that are going into the pockets of defense contractors. I hear my Republican friends talk about balancing the budget day in and day out. Right now, they are literally advancing an appropriations bill that cuts WIC. I mean, that literally cuts funding for pregnant mothers and children in the name of fiscal responsibility. They want to nickel and dime struggling moms and hungry kids. Uh, but you mean to tell me that we can't do better uh, in terms of finding savings in the Pentagon? I just don't, I just don't believe that. Uh, so here's my view. I think we, we need to broaden our idea of what a strong national defense looks like in this country. National security isn't just the number of bombs that we have stockpiled. I think our definition of national security ought to include the number of families who have a roof over their heads and three square meals a day. I think national security ought to include whether our air is clean and our water is pure. I think national security ought to include when our citizens have access to quality schools and good health care. I think national security ought to include when we uh, demonstrate to the world that we are protecting civil rights and advancing equal opportunities for all Americans. Uh, that's what I think our definition of national security ought to include. And yes, our national security ought to include having the best paid, best equipped military in the world. Uh, but let's not conflate national security with throwing endless sums of money at the Pentagon. And let's not confuse na national security with military spending so wasteful that it weakens our nation. The NDAA spends a whopping $842 billion on the Pentagon, but that money is not going to fix our problems. And I think it's time that we rethink what national security means and reinvest a lot of that money back into programs that directly help our people, or at a minimum, let's not nickel and dime programs like WIC uh, while we have no problem with raising uh, the amount we spend on the Pentagon budget. And while I appreciate the work that went into this bill, I have great respect for the chairman and ranking uh, member. Um, you know, and I, again, I thank them for their work and the work of their staff. Um, I just have a difficult time with this trend that we seem to uh, be uh, embracing. Um, and um, especially at a time when so many families in this country are struggling to make ends meet. Uh, aside from the sky high top line spending number, there, there could also be serious issues here depending on which amendments are made in order uh, in the final bill and how they're made in order um, in, in, the, in the final bill. I mean, was, I'm, we're talking about extreme measures that push, push domestic culture wars and, and do nothing to uh, strengthen our national defense. The most alarming amendments um, that, uh, you know, would, would further restrict access to reproductive health care attack the uh, LGBTQI plus community, target diversity and inclusion initiatives, withdraw U.S. support for, for Ukraine, and more. As the chairman mentioned, there are lots of amendments that have been, audit, that, that have been offered. I hope that a lot of them um, uh, are, are made in order. Um, I hope we have a robust debate um, on this bill. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think today's discussion will be an important one. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I yield back. I thank my good friend for his opening remarks. And we'll just point out top lines actually where the president wanted it to be, not where Chairman Rogers probably wanted it to be, not where I wanted it to be. So, uh, and again, I compliment both the chair and the ranking member on, on uh, finding a way to come together and, and report out a product with such overwhelmingly bipartisan support out of their committee. It speaks well of you both.
Uh, without objection, any prepared statements that our witnesses may have will be included in the record. I'd like to welcome our first panel, Chairman Mike Rogers and Ranking Member Adam Smith from the Committee on Armed Services. Chairman Rogers, welcome back to the Rules Committee, and I would welcome your opening testimony. Thank you, Chairman Cole and uh, Ranking Member McGovern and members of the committee. I really want to thank your staff as well for being so helpful as we move this uh, product uh, out of committee and then to the Rules Committee. And I want to thank Ranking Member Smith, who has just been a tremendous partner uh, in running this committee. Uh, and as evidence of that, uh, the last two years when he was chairman and I was ranking, we passed this bill out of committee 58 to 1. And when chairs have changed, we passed up 58 to 1. I think our committee is um, the ideal example of bipartisanship, and I hope that uh, we'll see more of our committee colleagues do the same. Uh, Congress has the constitutional duty to provide for our common defense. Every year we fulfill this duty uh, by passing the NDAA. The FY24 NDAA provides our warfighters the resources and authorities they need to provide for the defense of our nation and that of our allies around the world. Last week, Ranking Member Smith and I uh, led a bipartisan delegation to Taiwan. We heard directly from Taiwan's president about the escalating threats they're facing from the Chinese Communist Party. We met with our allies and partners in Japan and the Philippines who are seeking to strengthen our defense partnership in the face of this growing Chinese aggression. Finally, we met with the Indo-Pacific commander who walked us through the needs to keep pace with the Chinese military and properly defend ourselves and our allies. What was clear from all these discussions was that the threat posed by China is real, and it represents the most pressing national security challenge we've faced in decades. The FY24 NDA was built with that underlying goal to deter China. It provides new authorities and speeds uh, the fielding of innovative new technologies like artificial intelligence, hypersonics, that will give us the advantage in a conflict with China. It strengthens our security partnerships with Taiwan and Pacific allies. It fully funds and expedites the modernization of nuclear deterrent. It builds a stronger and more capable missile defense. It protects the U.S. bases, critical infrastructure, and academic research from Chinese encroachments and espionage. It builds the logistics networks in the Pacific that the military needs to carry out operations against China. And it includes new authorities to retool and revitalize the industrial base to ensure they can deliver the systems we need to prevail in the conflict. Reorienting our defense to deter the threat from China will be an expensive endeavor. But we acknowledge there are limits on what we can afford to spend. That's why this NDA is hyper-focused on rooting out waste at the DOD. If weapon systems are not responsive to the threats we face, we've cut them. In fact, the NDA includes nearly $40 billion in savings from cutting systems that can't survive in a conflict with China and by reining in programs that have grown out of control. We also penalize DOD defense, the DOD and defense contractors for cost overruns. We require the DOD Inspector General to review major defense programs for waste and create new Special Inspector General to oversee the Ukraine. In the face of growing threats from China, it's critical we restore the military's focus on lethality. The FY24 NDA does so by bringing in to divisive policies implemented by this, this administration that have hurt recruiting, unit cohesion, and military readiness. It is also critical that we recruit and retain the most skilled fighting force on the planet. That's why improving the quality of life for our service members and their families remains a top priority. The NDA provides for the largest pay raise in 30 years and authorizes a bonus for junior enlisted. We strongly believe that no military family should ever rely on welfare to get by. The FY24 NDAA increases allowances for housing and basic needs to counteract growing costs of, for food and housing. It authorizes $200 million more than the President requested to build new barracks and family housing. The bill expands access and significantly reduces the cost of child care for military families. It makes it easier for military spouses to find jobs when service members are transferred. Finally, it improves the quality of and delivery of military health care. And we put an extra emphasis on expanding access to mental health services for service members and their families. This NDA represents a truly bipartisan bill. It passed out of committee, as I said earlier, 58 to 1. It executes on hundreds of hours of bipartisan oversight conducted by members and staff over the past few months. 
It will help build a ready, capable, and lethal fighting force we need to deter China and our adversaries. Finally, I've heard my, uh, the concerns by members on both sides that over the past several years, the NDA has turned into an omnibus authorization bill filled with provisions that have little to do with defense. In response, the bill before you today includes only provisions squarely within the jurisdiction of the Armed Services Committee. Whether that policy continues as this bill moves uh, forward is up to y'all. <laughs> However, as you consider which amendments to make in order, I would respectfully request that you focus on amendments that advance the security of our nation and the needs of our service members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I yield back. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Ranking Member Smith, great to have you back at the Rules Committee, and you're recognized for your opening statement. It's always good to be here, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to echo the remarks of the Chair and the Ranking Member, as well as, as my Chairman on the Armed Services Committee, about how important this bipartisan process is and, and how well it works. Well, once again this year, we had a lengthy process in committee. We had robust debate about a number of different amendments, and we produced a bipartisan product through the normal legislative process. I really want to congratulate uh, Chair Chairman Rogers for doing such a great job in running the committee. I remember the first year that I was chairman. It's not easy. Um, <laughs> you know, you think you're sitting there for all those years, but, you know, actually having the responsibility of running the committee is a whole other thing. And, and Mike did an outstanding job and, you know, worked very closely uh, with his staff and my staff and I think pr produced an excellent product. The product basically is the interweaving of three different very important ideas. Number one, and most importantly, is supporting the men and women who serve our country and their families. And you see that throughout the bill, the pay raise certainly being the highlight. But there are things for um, basic housing allowance increases, bonuses. All of those don't happen if we don't pass an NDAA. All of those are critical to recruiting and retaining the best force uh, that we possibly uh, can, can have. Uh, there is also a number of provisions in there that have to do with military construction. The military construction can impact things like child care, obviously the quality of life for men and women who are serving in the military and their families. So number one is protecting the families. Number two is understanding the threat environment that we face. And the chairman mentioned China. And I think that the threat environment is clear. And certainly dealing with the rise of China and their increasingly aggressive tactics, not just in Asia, by the way, but across the world, is job one. But we also have to worry about Russia, Iran, North Korea, and there continue to be transnational terrorist threats, all of which want to disrupt peace and security in the world and undermine the rules-based international order that we are part of trying to maintain. So we have to understand those threats and meet them. Towards that end, we continue to support Ukraine. And make no mistake about it, if you are concerned about China, you have to be concerned about Ukraine, and you have to be concerned about what Russia is doing there. If Russia is able to, through military aggression, rewrite international borders, that paves the way for China and anyone else strong enough to think they can do it to do the same. If Russia succeeds in Ukraine, it is the single greatest blow that we could have to containing the threat that we see from China. And I do hope that, that folks understand that. So we, we understand the threat environment and prepare to meet it through support for Ukraine and also continuing support for the Indo-PACOM uh, defense initiative, which helps our partners and allies. And it was actually a very encouraging trip. Um, you know, Taiwan understands, obviously, the threat. But both the Philippines and Japan have really stepped up uh, just in the last couple of years, understanding the need for a balance against China. And I do want to be clear, China's going to be a power in the world. There is no reason we can't peacefully coexist with them. But that's what we want, peaceful coexistence with respect for international laws and international borders. And we are building and growing our partnerships in a very positive way. I, I thank the Biden administration for their expanded training relationship with the Philippines the um, development of the AUKUS uh, arrangement, the quad between, um, oh, I'm going to mess that up, but Australia, Japan, India, and the U.S., all effort to build those partnerships and alliance. And then the third thing is what the chairman did an excellent job of outlining, we have to modernize the force. If we've learned anything from Ukraine, new, most capable technologies are critical. And there are a thousand different details to that. But the easiest way to sum it up is information systems, missiles, missile defense, drones, and counter drone. If you are the best at those five things, you are going to be in the best position to deter your adversaries and protect your national security interests. We are doing reasonably well. We have a ways to go. 
Pentagon does not always modernize quickly. We have, over the years, put into the bill ways to help them with that, to make quicker decisions, to innovate, take on board new technologies. But those are the three things that are going to be key in meeting our national security needs. I do just want to quickly address a couple of the issues that the chair and the ranking uh, brought up. I saw the 60 Minutes report. It is worth noting that the overwhelming majority of all of those instances were things that had happened in the past. And this committee is actually really focused on that. There was one particular incident just a couple years ago uh, of terrible price gouging. We found it, and we took steps to correct it. We didn't simply let it go. The audit continues to be an issue. It is true that the full Pentagon cannot pass an audit, audit but we are taking it step by step, expanding the areas where audits are, are done to get to the point where we have that full audit. We are taking seriously the problem of making sure that the money is well spent. We shouldn't kid ourselves. You are not going to eliminate waste in human endeavors. That's just not going to happen. But we can and should doing better, and most importantly, we are doing better with, with a long way to go. And I do want to talk just briefly about diversity and clean energy. Um, we can have a disagreement on policy. It's not political, all right? It is a bedrock belief that we have to have access to clean energy if we are going to meet our national security needs. To begin with, we, we need more options. Wouldn't we love to not have to argue with Saudi Arabia about whether or not they're going to increase production of oil? Wouldn't we love to be able to say, hey, if you got it, that's fine. If you don't, we got other sources. We've got wind. We've got solar. We've got hydrogen. We've got a way out of that chokehold. That is absolutely about national security meeting those needs. And lastly, a diverse force is crucial. We have recruitment challenges. We cannot take large groups of people and exclude them from that process. And I would remind the committee that, what, 13 years ago was when we finally allowed gay people to serve in the military. And I will also, not to, well, I'll remind the committee every single Republican voted against that, voted against the defense bill in that year because of that. And can you honestly say that we would be better and safer if we took every single gay person and said, you can't serve in the military. This is about national security. This isn't about a left-wing political agenda. This is about making sure that we recruit everybody who is qualified to serve in the military, that we don't discriminate against them. And because of that history, because that history of outright excluding gay people, outright excluding trans people, I mean, what was it just three, four years ago that we voted to do that? and a rather extensive history of not giving women an adequate chance. In fact, I'll, I'll close on this. We had an interesting exchange on this in committee fighting about this. And there was a member of our committee, a woman who had served in the military, who was against these diversity ideas and said, you know, I served in the military. And yeah, I know, I had to work twice as hard. And I, all, I, I knew that I was under scrutiny. And why did she have to work twice as hard? OK. And if you're a woman and you're trying to figure out, should I join the military? Don't you need to know that you're going to get a fair shake? If someone comes to you and says, hey, come join us. It's going to be tough, difficult. It's going to be tough. We're not going to treat you fairly. You're going to have to work twice as hard to get the same thing as a man. But we'd love to have you. That's not going to go over well. We need to take affirmative steps to recruit populations that have been historically marginalized and discriminated against to make sure that they join and fight for us. We need all the talent of this country. It's not just something that is political. Though I fully understand, on both the left and the right, it gets political. But in the Department of Defense, they're doing it to try to make sure they have the best possible fighting force they can. And I hope this bill, once we get through this process, will, will reflect all of those goals and objectives. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, before I get into a couple more remarks, I just want to quickly associate myself with what you had to say about Ukraine and the important connection there between what happens there and what our adversaries or potential adversaries in the Western Pacific uh, might draw. That's, that's uh, a, uh, an important linkage that I think sometimes gets lost in, in the debate. They are very closely tied together. Chairman Rogers, uh, critics of this annual defense measure use its size to justify their opposition. And there are certainly cases in which large pieces of legislation equate to bureaucratic bloat. Yet in this instance, it seems that the 1,200-plus pages represent hundreds of provisions offered by individual members of Congress on both sides of the aisle through regular order. On behalf of the men and women at Tinker Air Force Base in my district, thank you for your efforts um, on one such provision related to the F-35 oxygen shock, very important in my part of the world. Uh, we throw the term regular order around here quite frequently, 
Uh, some use its absence as a reason not to support something. But when regular order is the norm, some reject the final product if it doesn't perfectly align with their preferences. The challenge your committee faced this year was significant, uh, produce a forward-looking authorization measure that a Republican <laughs> House can support and that a Democratic president will sign into law. That will save taxpayer money while at the same time uh, giving our men and women in uniform the tools they need to protect our country amid escalating global instability and turmoil while still making sure that uh, they can put food on the table at home for their families. And I think you guys working together did an exceptional job in this legislation achieving that. Chairman, let me ask you, how many hours would you estimate were spent in hearings and briefings leading up to the introduction of this bill? Uh, we had 128 hearings, over 35 classified briefings, with over 125 hours total consumed in those. And how many hours were spent uh, in markup at the subcommittee and full committee level? Well, as a former HASP member, you will find this interesting. Uh, we spent 15 hours in markup, but it would have been a lot longer. This was the first year we used electronic voting, <laughs> which really, <laughs> it cut an extra three or four hours off the hearing. <laughs> But still, even with that, we spent 15 hours on it, to answer your question. And how many uh, member ideas were considered through the committee amendment process at the markup? 760 amendments were considered, 731 were adopted. And how many hours were spent uh, working with members I, on I'm the 1,500-plus amendments submitted to the rules? Thank, thank you. Yeah. The, Mr. Chairman, I want to say, th those who submitted to our staff in committee was well north of 1,000. Yeah. I yeah. mean... And these ideas get whittled down, whittled down, whittled down. So, sorry, it's just that the staff had to go through a lot more events, even in committee. But I'm That's sorry. That's exactly ahead. right. Yeah. Well, again, members may disagree with the policies contained in this bill. Uh, that's expected, and that's why we have floor amendment process. But the process you ran to produce this critical piece of legislation, I think, is exceptionally impressive. And, again, both of you deserve the credit for that. You and your staff and the ranking member and his staff deserve the appreciation of the entire body. This is a process that reflects the best of this institution and one that I wish more committees, frankly, would examine and, and follow. Mm -hmm. Chairman Rogers and ranking member Smith, this is directed to both of you. What's the practical impact on the men and women in uniform if this legislation is not enacted this year? Uh, the, the bill provides for critical authorities requested by our military uh, to stay ahead of China. Failing to pass this bill means the military can't build barracks, family housing, and child care facilities. It means the military can't pay service members recruiting and retention bonuses. It means the service members will pay more for child care and housing. It means more delays, less access to mental health and uh, for military families. Same question to you, Mark. I completely agree with what the chairman just said. He laid it out perfectly. And what would be the impact on our allies if this legislation is not enacted this year? And again, that's addressed to both of you. It just sends a terrible message to our allies, especially China, about the escalating, uh, escalating threats. This bill includes important new authorities to improve defense training in coordination with Taiwan, which, as you heard, we just came from there. That is critically important right now if we want to deter Chinese aggression. It strengthens the defense partnerships and intelligence sharing and logistics support partnerships with our allies in the Pacific, and it includes provisions requested by our combatant commanders uh, to counter Chinese presence in Africa and South America. Yeah, and I'd just add to that that it's the message it sends to, to partners in countries around the world. This is a global competition, and countries all over the world are looking at it, and they'd rather be with us. They would. But China's a fact of life. Even Russia, to some degree, is a fact of life, depending on where you are in the world. And if they don't know that we're going to be there to support them, to partner with them, to help them make sure they meet their needs, then they got no choice but to do what China's telling them to do. It really helps achieve that balance, and it gives these countries a, a counterbalance to China's power influence in, in the world. Without it, it, it sends a terrible message and pushes, pushes those countries to have to make deals they'd rather not make uh, with China and Russia and others. Well, I think you both have succeeded in that. Thank you. Uh, last question, and I'll direct this to you, Chairman. And, and it's, uh, you know, we have uh, concerns on our side of the aisle in this legislation as well. A number of members do. So how does this legislation fulfill the commitment that our conference, the Republican conference, made to the nation when the American people entrusted us with uh, leading the House of Representatives? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We promise to strengthen our national security by conducting vigorous oversight of the Biden administration. 
and by moving common sense legislation to address the administration's national security failures. Uh, the Armed Services Committee has done that. Uh, we've conducted dozens of hearings, briefings, and meetings over the last six months. We've called in the Biden defense officials and forced them to publicly account for their actions. Now we're considering an NDA that will carry out that accountability. It will force the administration to stop spending money on left-wing divisive programs. It cancels and reigns in out-of-control acquisition programs by saving $40 billion a year and restricts funding for Pentagon officials uh, who fail to comply with congressional intent. It, the, this NDA delivers on our commitment to the conference. Thank you. And uh, I'll just make the point once more. I want to congratulate you both because you've done what a committee is supposed to do. Uh, that is, you've worked together uh, hour on hour, day after day, week after week, month after month, and brought us a consensus product that you know, both sides agreed on almost unanimously. So again, that just speaks volumes about both of you and the manner in which you work together and the process that you followed uh, to bring us this. And I hope the Congress can do as well a good a job, uh, frankly, as you guys did uh, leading in, in committee. And we'll see how that goes going forward. With that, let me yield to my uh, very good friend and our distinguished ranking member for any questions he may have. Yeah, well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and I again, appreciate your testimony and appreciate all the work that you've put on the bill. And I appreciate the reassurance that the committee is taking seriously the reports of cost overruns. Uh, but I got to tell you, uh, that's not the first time I've heard that. Um, and I'm, I'm not a betting man, but I'm willing to bet that in a few months from now or a year from now, we're going to find out, uh, we're going we're to find more reports of, uh, of massive and egregious cost overruns. And, uh, and again, I do think that there ought to be a complete audit. Um, other agencies have to do it. I just think it's... Uh, it, 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 everybody, my friends who are fiscally responsible, uh, it would seem to me that that would be a, a smart thing to do. And the reason why it, it bothers me so much, not just because it's a waste of taxpayers' money, but because if, when we find out that somebody gets one dollar more in SNAP benefits, it's like, you know, you know, the end of the world. Uh, and we have people calling for deep cuts in programs to provide food benefits to people. We're going through an appropriations process, as I mentioned in my opening statement, where um, WIC is being cut. Uh, you know, support for women's infants and children program is being cut. I mean, and we're told that that has to happen in the name of fiscal responsibility, and yet I don't think the Pentagon budget is held to the same standard. And, I, and, it, and it bothers me because uh, at the end of the day, when I define national security, it includes the quality of life for the people who, who live in this country. And so I look forward to, you know, to uh, continuing to watch the uh, oversight uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, there is a minimal amount of, of, of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, I also support, um, you know, the effort to, uh, to help uh, Ukraine ward off uh, Russian aggression. Uh, I will say that I have an issue, um, and let me, before I get to that, let me just say, you mentioned President Biden advocated a, a higher military budget. I don't agree with him on everything. I didn't agree with him on that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't either. Yeah, so, um, I, um, yeah, yeah, so, but, 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 but I'll go back to Ukraine. Uh, there are many of us who, uh, you know, who support providing um, help to the Ukrainians to, uh, to r push back Russian aggression. I was part of first delegation uh, to go to Ukraine with Speaker Pelosi uh, over a year ago, um, and I uh, learned firsthand about the atrocities that are being committed against Ukrainian people by the, by the Russians. However, um, I, I'm not in alignment with the President on using cluster munitions. I know there's a division in our, our caucus, and I think there's some, even some Republicans who may not think that that is a good use uh, of um, that does not it's, not, it's not a wise choice. And we can argue that. Um, there is an amendment uh, to, to debate this issue um, and to let members vote up or down on it. I don't know whether either of you have an opinion of whether or not um, the House should be able to debate uh, the issue of cluster munitions or not. Uh, but if you have an opinion, I'd lo love to hear it. Fine with me. Fine, fine with me, too. I mean, I think Good, then I hope, then I hope yeah. it's made in order. 
uh, and we'll be able to have that debate um, and that vote. And the final thing, and this, and again, I, I told you my concerns about the bill, uh, just in terms of the, of the, of the number. Um, but, um, you know, there are news reports out uh, today. I'm just reading a CNN report uh, that the House GOP leaders are confronting a legislative landmine over a massive defense bill on right, um, as right-wing lawmakers are pushing for a slew of hot-button amendments that would put moderate Republicans in a complicated position and threaten Democratic support for a must-pass bill. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I mean, are, are you, I mean, you mentioned it, um, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, briefly, but I mean, I mean, it's not just issues on the LGBTQI plus community. It's, uh, it's issues that would further restrict access to reproductive health care uh, for service members. Uh, I mean, obviously target diversity and inclusion initiatives. I, I mean, I'm not sure how they're going to decide all this at the end, um, but are you concerned that the Democrats who normally would support this, if these things get attached to it, if it becomes a Christmas tree on hot button issues that satisfy the most extreme elements on the right, that somehow that may make it impossible for some Democrats to support this bill? Well, two things to that. First of all, let me say, having been through this process many times, I am concerned pretty much every step of the way. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> we got to get it out. We got to get it out of committee. Well, how do you strike that balance? All right, we got to get it through the rules committee. How do you strike that balance? Okay, what what amendments passed? What amendments didn't pass? What was in order? Constantly, I we both worry about this constantly. And I will say, and we we work together on it. You know, we're, we're both like, okay, how do we get the votes? How do we do? What do we do? So. Yes, uh, is, is the short answer. And look, I, you know, I mean, there's, as you know, there's 1,500 amendments. I don't, I, nothing that is ruled in order is going to cause me to, well, I suppose if it was nothing but Republican amendments rules in order and there was no balance there, but that's about the rule. It's a matter of what passes on the floor. And look, I mean, there's, I don't know how many, but there's several dozen, I would guess, amendments that if they pass will, would make it problematic. And I'm sure the same was, you know, many times true on the Republican side. It's the reality that the party in power decides what amendments you debate and has greater control over which ones pass. And if it goes too far and it is no longer what I feel is a bipartisan bill, then we'll have to deal with that. But we trust all of your judgment um, to, to make sure that we get to a good place on that and we get the, uh, something in the neighborhood of the bipartisan bill that we passed out of committee. Now, look, you know, what we always say on this, too, no matter how this bill comes out, there's going to be stuff in there the Democrats don't like and there's going to be stuff in there the Republicans don't like. I mean, it is a bipartisan, bicameral, signed by the president process. There is no way to do that where one party gets everything they want and likes everything in the bill. It doesn't work that way. It, it, it's a balance. I've always referred to it as you know, sort of a tapestry. It's like you look at the whole picture. It's not any one thing. But yes, we will absolutely have to look at the whole picture as those amendments pass. There are a number of amendments here that are deeply troubling if they pass. And that, that will have to factor into my calculation and I think every member's calculation. Uh, when they decide how to vote, and we're going to try to make sure that we get to the place where we can have a strong, a bipartisan vote in this bill as possible. Yeah, and the hope would be that um, obviously some of these controversial amendments might, might not be able to pass on their own. So there's a, the concern would be that they, that you know, um, I, again, I have no idea because I'm not in on the, uh, the private discussions between the Freedom Caucus and uh, and the leadership here, but I do worry about you know. Um, self-executing amendments and when the rule passes that all of a sudden these things are, are part of the base bill um, as a way to protect moderate members from not having to take a tough vote or to assure that the, the extreme right wing that you know that you don't have to worry about losing a vote yeah uh, just no yeah I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go ahead and say I mean look it's a decision that you know you all have to make and the Republican leadership has to make this bill needs to be bipartisan to pass that was true when we were running the place, and it's true when you're running the place, and I hope we'll take that into consideration as we're working through this. I appreciate you both being here. Thank you for your work. I yield back. Thank you very much. We'll now go to the distinguished vice chairman of the committee, my good friend from Texas, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, thank you for being here. Uh, <clears throat> chairman Rogers and Chairman Cole and I came in this the same year. We had, a, I think, a five-vote majority yeah. in the, on the Republican side that year. 
we passed a budget by one vote, and we passed every appropriations bill under an open rule before September 30th, and at the end of the year, we passed the Medicare Part D. So a very productive Congress, and if you have the will to be productive, you can be. So I look forward to us continuing that, uh, that history of, of being productive. It's too bad Mr. McGovern left. I was going to take occasion to agree with him <laughs> on, the, uh, on the concept of, of cluster munitions being delivered to, to Ukraine. It, 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 is, it does bother me as well. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner Smith, I guess, let me just ask you, so 13 months ago, Speaker Pelosi brought to the floor a Ukraine aid package that was hastily drawn together, seemed important because of the suffering that was going on at the hands of, of the Russians, of Vladimir Putin in, in the country of Ukraine, and how viciously they had been attacked, and, and your concept of another country enforcing its own idea of what the borders of a country should be, ideas that we thought we'd all left behind in 1938 and 1939. And yet, um, I'll tell you what's been tough for me. The administration will not come and talk to us about what the strategy is in Ukraine. We were told in February of last year that the Russians were amassing on the border, and then we had another classified briefing where they said, oh, it's, it's going to be over so quick, and Kiev will fall in three days. And then it didn't. And President Zelensky emerged as uh, uh, some of the people in his country could follow, and they've they fought very valiantly against the uh, the Russian aggressors. But we've gone from what we were told would be a very quick action and the Russians would win to a protracted war of attrition. <clears throat> and now we're talking about delivering cluster munitions into that country. So. I think it's fair to say the equation has significantly changed. We didn't have another classified briefing until July of 2022. And then it was not Secretary Austin, Secretary Blinken, ODNI, uh, General Milley. It was the undersecretaries who came and talked to us at the end of July of last year. And then it was many, many months again before we had another briefing. I don't understand why we have not had an Oval Office address to the people of the United States explaining why our support and our action is necessary. So I'm not criticizing you, but may I just ask both of you, uh, could you commit to helping me as a rank and file humble backbencher in the United States House of Representatives to getting a meaningful classified briefing from the principles involved, we need to understand what the overall strategy is that is being pursued in the name of the United States of America right now. I cannot tell my constituents what that is because I honestly don't know. And for heaven's sakes, if it wasn't for General Jack Keane going on Fox News, I don't know that anyone would have articulated a strategy, but it hasn't come from the administration. And yeah. it needs to come from the administration. Yeah, I don't really agree with that. First of all, let me just say the strategy has been clear from the start, and and I I don't think I've encountered a foreign policy that had a clear, straightforward strategy. And they've said over and over and over again. The president has addressed this on on many occasions, as has Mr. Sullivan, as has Chairman Milley, as has the Secretary of Defense, in a variety of different forums. And the strategy is this: we need to do everything we can to help protect a sovereign, democratic Ukraine. When this is done, Ukraine needs to be a country, and they need to be sovereign and democratic. And number two, we cannot stumble into a direct conflict between NATO and Russia. That has been their strategy if, from the very start. If I may reclaim my time for a no, moment, that is sure. precisely my concern. That, that, I mean, there are days where it doesn't seem like there is a coherent direction. The recent announcement that we're going to deliver cluster munitions to the battlefield, I mean, where did that come from? Did, well, I can tell you where it, where, where it came from, and 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 I, you know, I understand there's 535 members here, but the chairman has regularly had classified briefings from the DoD people who are coming in there. You know, we've we've regularly had those conversations, and I can answer the cluster munitions question, and I've I've heard it answered by many, and I think Jake Sullivan summed it up very very well. 
what is going on, and this has been you know all, all over the news, not not, not just on Fox, um, elsewhere where they've talked about what the what the Ukrainians are trying to do is they're trying to retake their territory. Step one, they stopped the Russians. They actually retook some territory last summer, primarily in the east and north. Now it is focused on the south, Zaporizhia and Kherson. And I've seen all the charts and all the graphs in open source, and the president has talked about it as well. They want to retake that territory and, and push the Russians back. The problem is Russians are dug in this time. They, they are dug in really solidly. Um, it's as elaborate as all the defenses, type of defenses that we faced on D-Day and elsewhere, and pushing through those things are hard. So what the administration has done for the last you know, six to eight months, trained and equipped the Ukrainians to put them in the best possible position to succeed in that counteroffensive. And that's what they're trying to do. Primarily, poke a hole and get back to the Sea of Azov so that you can cut off that land bridge and re reclaim their country. There is a sovereign democratic Ukraine right now, there would be a much more sovereign democratic Ukraine if they had Zaporizhia, Kherson, and preferably Donetsk back. And they are trying to push through it. Let me finish. Um, so, and it's a huge challenge. And we've been providing them with a large number of munitions. We are running low on those munitions. Now, I want to make one thing 100% clear. When I say we are running low, not the U.S. We are not giving the Ukrainians past the point that undermines our national security. So we're not running out. We're running low on munitions that we can provide them in order to push that counteroffensive. For that counteroffensive to succeed, they need munitions, and the only munitions we have in excess, in the hundreds of thousands, are the depickums, the cluster munitions. Cluster munitions, which, by the way, have a dud rate of just over 1% compared to the 30% dud rate that the Russians are landing down on civilian targets all across the country all the time. We are giving them those munitions, as Jake Sullivan explained very clearly just a couple of days ago. We're giving them those munitions so that they can continue to prosecute that counteroffensive and have a chance to be successful in taking back their country. And you can argue with that policy, certainly. I don't think it's fair to say that it's not clear. It's, it may not succeed because it's really difficult. And but I'm, it's I'm going to differ with you. It has yeah. not been made clear. And then it has, you have the president pull on Fareed Zakaria yesterday and said, yeah, we're giving them plus three munitions because they ran out of everything else. That is not helpful when, when that type of statement is made by the President of the United States. But isn't that fundamentally accurate? I mean, that's the point. We don't have, we don't have other munitions to give them, so we're giving them the, these cluster munitions so that they can prosecute it. What's, what's inaccurate about what the President said? I don't, um, you, you tell me. Uh, Nothing's inaccurate about it. It is precisely the situation that I just described and that we are facing. You know, do we wish that the Ukrainians would have just punched through and raced to the sea and the Russians would have headed back to Russia in a week or two? Sure, but that's just not the way war works. They're dug in and it's going to be hard. The determination we made, we have to help them. Well, and I appreciate your, your discussion so, here. Yeah. I, I would ask both of you, help us as rank and file members of the House of Representatives who are having to vote on these appropriations, these defense bills, help us get access to the same type of information that you're getting. That's what I was just about to extend to you. We have a monthly meeting with the administration, classified, to talk about progress and plans forward. I welcome you to join uh, those monthly meetings uh, with those folks. And well, I would very much it. appreciate uh, taking you up on that because it has been, it has been difficult. Again, yeah. we went from it'll be gone in three days to a war of attrition. <clears throat> and that's what our constituents see. Yeah. And maybe not in your part of the world, but in my part of the world, the decision to provide open-ended munitions, military support to Ukraine has been significantly unpopular in, in parts of the country. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I get that. We it's won't not, defend our border, but we defend their border. It's, it's not. It's, it's the it's, argument that is made. Sure. It's not open-ended. Okay, to begin with, like I said, we are maintaining the stockpiles that we need to meet our national security needs, and we are not willing to get into a direct war with Russia. So it's not open-ended. Um, it's within those well, and constraints. That, but that, that's what underlies all of this, is we are, you know, unlike the, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, we are dealing with the nuclear power. Yeah. And it's, it, is, it is a different equation on a lot of different levels. Well, I appreciate the opportunity or the, the offer for the opportunity to have complete things, but I would also say, I mean, the, 
the general body needs to have more information coming to us for the amount of money that has gone into this to have had a total of three or four classified briefings and only two with the principals, only two with, with General Austin, General Milley, uh, Avril Hain, and uh, uh, Secretary Blinken. We've only had two such briefings, so there, there needs to be more. And if we're going to be supplying what you're asking, the Congress needs to be read into it. And, you know, it gets to another problem that uh, I encounter, and it, it's our fault for doing CRs and, and omnibus bills. Cabinet secretaries don't know where their money comes from anymore. When we used to do the regular appropriations process, they kind of got it that they had to answer a phone call from even a humble backbencher like me. They had to they had to respond when a member of Congress called. Now they don't because they're going to get their money in an omnibus or a CR. So I, I actually hope we do a better job with that going forward, Mr. Chairman. And just to end on a note of agreement, I completely agree with you <laughs> on that last point. And that's why Mike and I do what we do on our bill. Right. We're not giving it up. We're going to have every member have their say in committee on the full floor so that we continue to be relevant on at least oversight of our, of our defense policy. So it's really important. I agree with you. Right. So another point of agreement I have with you, Mr. Smith, is it is great to not have to go and ask Saudi Arabia. Um, in fact, we were in that position three years ago when we were energy when we were energy dominant. For some strange reason, this administration gave that away, and I I'm aligned with you. I want us to get back to a point where we don't have to ask uh, potential enemies in the Middle East um, and and base our energy policy. Uh, based on how they how they view us. I'm sorry, but I just to say two things about that. Number one, we were never in a position where what Saudi Arabia did with the oil supply didn't matter to us, never. And number two, as we sit here today, we are producing more oil and natural gas as a country than we ever have in history. I will just say, in sitting in this very rules committee over on the minority <laughs> side, the night that Saudi uh, the <clears throat> Iranians thought it would be a good idea to attack the Saudi oil fields or Saudi refineries with drones, uh, I was terribly concerned because I thought the price of oil was going to spike the next day. It didn't budge because of the significant amount of production that was going on in the United States. We have not run, I'm from Texas, we have not run out of oil and natural gas in Texas. There's plenty there if you will just allow us, if you will just allow us to produce it. We have had discussions in these NDAA talks before about the privatized military housing, and there were some problems with the maintenance, deferred maintenance on, on military housing. Uh, that didn't come up in your discussions today. Is, has that been taken care of? There has been significant attention uh, applied to that. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of continuing problems with it, but it has been a problem in the past. I, I, again, it's something that requires our continued Always. surveillance Always. Uh, many of this a lot of this housing stock is back from the the middle 1990s and and uh, with the ravages of time it, it needs attention and we don't want our service members being required to live in housing that is uh, but I want you to understand that's true of all military housing not just the privatized uh, we just returned from from uh, the Asian Pacific and we saw terrible circumstances uh, in both Guam and Japan that are just indefensible, and we've got to get after that. And, and those had those were not privatized. Well, I do encourage you to... We're after We're on it like white on rice. It is refreshing. In 2015, when Barbara Lee and I brought an audit to Pentagon amendment, we were vilified for, for having brought it up. I, I'm, I'm glad to see there's so much unanimity of, uh, of opinion that, in fact, that is uh, it's an idea whose... Whose time has uh, whose time has come? I I was going to offer an amendment. I didn't do it because I didn't think there was time to adequately discuss it. But I hope it's something. I want to put it on your radar screens for for down the road. Uh, apparently, in an NDAA last year or the year before, there was an amendment accepted that uh, prohibited a member of the one of the service academies from uh, delaying their service to be a part of a, a major, major league sports. And the, uh, this was brought up to me by, by several constituents. Uh, there was an Air Force 
recruit Paul Skeens, who left the Air Force Academy. I'm sure Steve Scalise thinks it's a good idea. He went to LSU. They won a world championship. He's now the number one uh, draft choice for the Major League Baseball. But what a missed opportunity for the positive of marketing that, that this young man would have provided had he been allowed to continue in the Air Force Academy to lay his service uh, for a few years while he uh, uh, played in the major leagues. I don't know if you've had any opportunity to think about that anymore, but I, I hope you will give some attention to that. We, uh, we need to be careful. We need to be fair. And, and certainly the, the commitment that's made of a young man or woman going into the service academies is one that must be taken very, very seriously. But on the other hand, it, uh, there's a potential for a good news story to come out of one of the academies is that, uh, again, there's no reason that LSU gets all that glory. It could have belonged to the Air Force Academy. And I, I'm interested in your thoughts on that, but beyond that, I have no other uh, statements. Yeah, I mean, what we, ran, what we ran into is, I mean, the Senate feels very strongly, or at least the, the leadership of the Senate feels very strongly in the other direction that, to your last point, that you made that commitment, you keep that commitment. Now, we had, in last year's bill, we removed it, and we said, no, you've got to serve your, your five years. It was actually controversial because there was a, an athlete at uh, the Army Academy that was, you know, played to be a draft pick, and it would have just, phew, so we grandfathered it. And we grandfathered anyone who was in the existing group now, but that only helps for a couple of years, and then you will have that problem. And I tend to agree with you. Um, you know, like I said, we ran into opposition from the Senate that takes a harder line. It's like you serve, you, you but I think what, well, what the military determined a couple of years ago, and actually uh, Secretary of the Army McCarthy was the one who was overseeing this, and he got very passionate in talking to me about this, that, you know, that, like you said, this is a very positive thing for the military, to have someone who's come through, who goes on and becomes president. And it doesn't happen very often. Right. You know, we're talking about two, three, four, maybe, um, maybe one a year if you're lucky, and usually not. Um, so it, it, it it's... It's not worth it to make make the change this way, and yeah, it's something we're going to need to work on. But we're going to have to get past the other body at this point to make that change. All right, I just want to put it on your yeah. put it on your radar. Several uh, alum have brought it up to me back home, yeah. and again, I'm sure Steve Scalise sees a, an upside for getting him to LSU, but he could have been an Air Force grad. Thank you both for for your for your work on this. It's a it's a significant effort. Thanks. Don't tell Mr. Uh, McGovern that I agreed with him. My good friend uh, from New Mexico, Ms. Ledger Fernandez, is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Chair and Ranking Member, for your work together. You know, the first uh, briefing you had uh, in the Ukraine in the uh, several briefings that I went to, I was struck by how well the two of you worked together and how you were focused on our national security. And I do appreciate the way in which you have described that that national security has many elements and many threats to it, and you are trying to address them in this bill. Uh, and one of the biggest resources, as we know, is our, uh, our actual service members. And it's not enough to constantly be thanking them for their service. Uh, we actually have to provide them with the resources they need, uh, which you're doing with the increase in pay. And importantly, the increase in what you need to be able to serve. So from the housing uh, to child care centers. I represent a, a very rural district. The, my biggest city uh, is 80,000 people. <laughs> I've been to your district. Yeah, you've been to my district. I love my district. I think it is the most beautiful of all districts in the country. Uh, but like many rural districts, it hosts, uh, um, it hosts bases uh, where they place Air Force bases where you could have planes flying over and there's nobody complaining, right? And so, so New Mexico has three Air Force bases precisely for that reason. We also have um, both Sandia and the Los Alamos National Labs. So I wanted to ask a couple of questions because I think they're important to my district, but they're important to all of the world districts that we see. Um, and, and, and one of those is indeed the importance of supporting the quality of life issues on housing, on mental health, uh, and on child care. And I think that you are trying to do that in this bill. Uh, and can you actually set out why it's that important to make sure we have that housing? 
uh, in Clovis, for example, which is in my, uh, that's the Cannon Air Force Base, the need for more and better housing and their space for it and how this bill actually does that and where we might need to do even better. If you could both address that. Okay. Uh, we, we do in this bill deal with all of those. Um, but I also want you to know this, not, not just this bill, we are very serious about this quality of life issue. And starting in June, uh, we have set up a, a task force on quality of life, bipartisan, to deal to, to come forward with a package of reforms that we can put in next year's NDA that go much further mm -hmm. than what we've been doing so far. You know, I'm really proud of the 5.2% pay increase. I'm proud of what we're doing to relieve uh, housing costs. I'm proud of what we're doing in here to, to relieve uh, uh, child care expenses, uh, a whole host of things. But they don't go nearly far enough to, to, tr to value service members the way we think they should be valued to deal with the recruitment and retention problems that we're having in, the, in the, all the services right now. So I want you to know that while we're very proud of what we put in here and that we think it goes a long way, you're going to see big leaps in next year's bill, but they're going to be thoughtful, and that's why we're taking six months. And we waited till after the NDA uh, committee process and all our hearings were done for the task force to start its work. It started right before we left for the recess so that we do get a thoughtful report by the end of the year uh, that will deal with the broader concerns that we have on quality of life. So I would urge you that if you think of things that you would like to see addressed, make sure that you that, that task force is, is uh, informed about that because uh, we want it to be comprehensive. We want people to see the, uh, a career in the military as a career worth spending their life on. And not just the service member, but their families. We want their family to feel valued and their children to, want to, to stay in that. Because the fact is, historically, we've gotten our uh, biggest segment of service members from military families. Mm -hmm. This is not the case now. This is the first time in my lifetime that military families are not recommending uh, a career in the military to their children. We've got to reverse that. So I just want you to understand, we hear you, we're dealing with it, but there's a lot more coming. You know, and on that point, I would think, I would also say that in discussion of the importance of diversity and not seeing it as something that is undermines our national security, but rather that it uh, strengthens our national security to have a, to have a, a, a a military force that reflects America is really important. New Mexico has the largest percentage of veterans because it turns out that Native Americans and Hispanos, uh, uh, you know, join the military at greater numbers, and therefore, when they come home, uh, we have the such a large number. And I think that um, if if you could speak to that, Chairman Smith, of how do you see the importance of diversity? including both women and then the diverse Americans uh, that exist here, uh, both and bo maybe from both the chair and the ranking, but Ms., uh, ranking member Smith. Sure. First of all, I agree completely with everything Mike said about quality of life issues and our focus on the committee. That's why, I mean, our opening statements, that's what both of us led with, and it's the most important thing we do. Um, military construction contributes to that, but then also our support uh, for the pay, benefits, bonuses, everything that goes into the package uh, that helps uh, men and women be able to serve. We're very focused on that, and I look, look forward to what the task force has to say. I, I gave a fairly impassioned plea for diversity in my opening remarks, which I right. will, will, will not repeat. But the bottom line is, you know, we have to recruit from the entire country. Um, we have to reach into all communities. We cannot be excluding women or gay people or trans people. Um, and also, historically, I know people of color have served in the military. And frankly, most people of color that I've talked to about this say that you know the military is, was relatively egalitarian, but when you look at the promotions, mm -hmm. you know, it just you, you don't have you know an adequate reflection at the highest levels of our military. So I think you know having some effort to say, hey, how are we going to go out into communities that have been either discriminated against or marginalized in the past and make sure that they feel welcome. All right. Now you can have bad diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. I am fully aware of that, and I have seen them. But what I don't want this bill to do is to eliminate it entirely, uh, which is what is being talked about and which what a number of the amendments do. 
because it misses the point of the fact that we need to affirmatively recruit in those communities that have not historically felt welcome and treated fairly, not just within the military, but within society more broadly. It's a way to make sure you're, you're reaching everybody um, that you bring in, in in a fair and equitable way. And, and that's what I hope we'll do in a reasonable way. I mean, look, like any program in the Pentagon, you want to have oversight, you think there's something going wrong with the DEI program, let's talk about it. Um, but that basic principle that it matters to do that outreach to diverse communities, I, you know, I don't understand the argument that says we shouldn't be doing that, not when we have to recruit. And the final point, I know and the chairman's not wrong that we are not as strong in terms of, you know, military families saying go into the military. I don't think it's, I don't think the chairman meant to say that nobody who's serving in the military is recommending to their family members oh, no. to join. Yeah. It's just smaller it's than just, it's, it's ever been. It's just down lower than it should. And we got to look at that aspect of the problem too. You know, what's yeah. going on? And that's what hopefully this task force will help so, us do. Thank you. And Chair Rogers, do you also agree with the impassioned plea that we uh, heard from Ranking Member Smith about the importance of, of diversity in the military and making sure that women, for example, have access to reproductive health care? I think that the, the military is a shining example of diversity for every organization in the country. It's, it's been a leader in that area for decades. And you want to keep it that way? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the other piece that is of, uh, of, uh, I think, great concern is that sometimes military bases uh, sometimes have some messes that they've left behind, and we need to clean those up. Uh, and as you, you know, we have everything from the PFAS uh, uh, problems uh, that need to be addressed, uh, as well as legacy cleanup. Uh, in New Mexico, we exploded the first, uh, the first atomic bomb. Uh, we are still not compensating uh, those who suffered from the fallout from that uh, atomic uh, bomb at, at Trinity. Uh, but we also have a lot of legacy uh, waste uh, that we, we need to do uh, in New Mexico and in places around the country. Every, you know, we didn't know as I don't think it was all, I don't think at all in any way was it intentional, but now that we know what we know, that it needs to be cleaned up. And uh, so uh, can you actually maybe both touch on that and how you see this bill doing that and whether you think that there needs to be a bit more on that? I'm not aware of anything extraordinary that we're doing with UXO and cleanup issues in this bill that's not already been ongoing. I don't know of any additional steps we've taken that would yield. Yeah, no, the only thing is that the portion of the budget would, of, the, of our bill that we don't usually talk about is the energy portion. Yes. Um, and that's where, where and I, that's I where think that's, I don't know, $40 billion, I'm wrong, it could be off there. But when you see the gap and we say there's an $886 yeah. billion dollar defense budget and then yeah. someone else says it's eight fifty. That gap is what's going to the Department of Energy, and there's a lot of different pieces to that, but a big piece of it is cleanup. Hanford is in my state, not in my district, but, but in my state, and we work on that legacy issue. Um, they're building a vitrification plant to deal with that waste. So, yes, it is something that you know our um, Strategic Forces subcommittee pays attention to and is very focused on those cleanup needs. Yeah, and I think it really is key. And the, 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 last, the last point is that, uh, you know, the quantum applications, that it's once again dealing with the, the importance of using the latest technology. New Mexico Sandia Labs mm -hmm. is involved in that as part of the co-leader. You haven't actually gotten to that, but that, that, that point, you said, uh, uh, Ranking Member Smith, about being at the forefront of the newest technologies and, and the role that I think that can play. Because it's also true that some of that work has spin-offs that is of, of civilian importance. And to remember that, and you know, that's what we deal with in, in New Mexico, is making sure that we capture both sides of it, that there's both non-military use for some of these technologies and everything. We don't want, you know, we, we, we don't want certain weapons uh, that are military style to be out, of, out and about, but we do want uh, um, that, that flow that can come, that when we are investing in these things, it it's, could be for multi-purposes. So thank you very much for all of the collaboration that you have uh, and look forward to uh, seeing what kind of amendments we uh, get in here and whether they uh, offer our ability to, to pass something that makes sense or, or, or not. <laughs> so thank you very much. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlelady from Minnesota, my good friend, Ms. Fishbox, uh, recognized for any questions she cares to ask. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just have a couple of things I just want to um, tell the chairman that I really appreciate your work on these C-130s. You know, for the National Guard, that's that's all that Minnesota has. And uh, 
in the last few years, we have been asking, requesting those C-130s, and, and I don't have to ask again because I know they're in there, so I appreciate the work on that. Um, the other thing that I maybe want, you may want to touch base with a little bit, you know, one of the things that my constituents are talking about is the, is the Ukraine money, and so much of it's going, and, um, and so I appreciate that you've got some um, provisions in the bill regarding transparency and accountability, and I thought maybe, um, because it is a huge concern for people, and that's, uh, we get a lot of constituent contact about that, if you could maybe expand on that a little bit and just uh, you know reassure us and tell us how that works in that yeah, bill. The, the funding for the Ukraine war is funded through the supplemental, not through the NDAA, uh, or, the, or the supporting appropriations bill. Uh, what is in the NDAA is $300 million uh, that has been in there every year going back to 2015 uh, for the, um, uh, I can't remember training. the acronym. Training. Yes, but what's the acronym for it? Yeah. Right. Anyway, training. A fancy name. <laughs> well, what we, did, we, we were part of a NATO effort yeah. after 2014 invasion to train the Ukrainians, and it's been $300 million a year in there every year since 2015. That's all that's in here for Ukraine now, is that continuing training money. Uh, but I want you to know that anything to do with the Ukraine war is being funded through the supplementals. Uh, the current supplemental uh, that's in place is adequate to get us through September. So if there's going to be any more funding that goes to support the Ukrainian war effort, it will be in another supplemental. It will not be in through this mechanism. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And, and I do just want to really briefly mention that you know, one of the other concerns that I hear quite a bit is that we are diverting a lot of money that should be going to national defense to doing a whole lot of things like critical race theory, diversity training, things like that. And so I want to make sure that, uh, that um, you know, we're focusing the money that, that our taxpayers think is going to defense is actually going to defense and not all kinds of uh, a variety of um, uh, programs. We had, we had a full, healthy debate a series of debates in this year's markup, and uh, as a result, we banned many of the controversial policies that this administration has been pursuing, such as CRT and drag shows. We eliminate a lot of the DIE, uh, DEI bureaucracy that has grown out of control, and many of the initiatives hurt recruiting and cohesion. So, yeah, there, there were several amendments that were adopted to deal with those. Well, thank you, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate your work on, on the bill, and um, look forward to spending the afternoon with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I yield back. <laughs> Chair, thanks, the gentlelady. The gentlelady yields back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from South Carolina. Okay. Gentleman yields back. Hang on just a second. <laughs> Maybe a brief soliloquy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be spending the afternoon talking about this. That's year. right. That's Mike right. and I will not be joining you. That's all. right. No, no, no. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what was that acronym, by the way? Was it European Defense Initiative? USAI. 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 Yeah. Yeah, uh, USAI. Yeah. Ukraine secure. Yeah. yeah, but it basically is training money as a part of our NATO effort to train up the Ukrainians. Uh, yeah. I just can't remember yeah. the acronym. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Chair is happy to recognize the gentlelady from Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rogers um, and Ranking Member. Uh, I want to just thank you both for your work on the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, we have, um, you guys have done a, a great deal of work on this. We've got a little bit of work left to do. Chairman Rogers, um, I don't have to tell you that NDAA is a large bill. Uh, understandably so, it goes to pro providing for the national defense. I know quality of life is a problem. In the armed services, can you tell us about a few things you've done in the NDAA to address those issues? Yeah, we include a 5.2% basic pay increase, the largest in over 30 years. Uh, we expand the basic needs allowance to assist service members supporting families. And we authorize bonuses for junior enlisted to combat infl inflation. We also authorize additional funding to renovate and build new barracks to reduce, uh, we reduce the out-of-pocket housing expenses for service members 
and we provide additional funding for new family housing. Uh, following up on that, if our service members are worried about child care, then our readiness suffers. Have you um, taken in any initiatives in the NDAA to address child care problems for our service members? Yeah, that is a real problem, and we uh, included $113 million in here for new construction of child care centers. Uh, we expand in-home child care to focus on rural areas, and we authorize new school fundings for military children. Thank you. I know, you know, when I was in the workforce um, and had young children, I had to choose between staying in the workforce and working to pay for child care or um, being at home with the kids. And fortunately, my husband was in a financial circumstance we, that we could do that. Uh, but I'd hate to think that some women, men and women, who want to join the service and serve our country might think that child care is a barrier. So I do appreciate your emphasis on that in this legislation. Um, I'm sure you, you would agree that... Um, while the NDAA is certainly responsible for, for providing our troops with the latest weapons and best equipment to complete their missions, the primary function of this bill is not to support any one weapon system, but uh, serving the brave men and women who wield those weapons in defense of all of us. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for your work on this bill. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Sure. Thanks, the gentlelady. The gentlelady yields back. We're going to pause for just a moment. We're waiting on someone on the uh, on the Democrat side to return. Okay. There being no other uh, members seeking to ask questions. Chair wants to thank the chairman and ranking member of the Armed Services Committee. It's always great to spend a day with you once a year and uh, look forward to, uh, to it happening again. But you are excused. The committee will now receive testimony from members wishing to uh, present amendments. Mr. Moylan, you may, uh, you may join us. So, <clears throat> pending other members coming, you are, you are recognized on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, today I come before you to give you a brief history about uh, Amendment 664, which is to report on utility requirements in Guam. This request, Department of Defense study, would analyze the current state of military infrastructure needs in Guam with respect to the island utilities. In the wake of Typhoon Mawar, the island's utilities were severely damaged due to part of their age and exposure to elements. The study would also examine the feasibility and potential cost of moving power lines underground. And finally, the study if existing water and wastewater infrastructures are sufficient as the military presence on Guam continues to grow. So it's critical that we harden our utility infrastructure on Guam to ensure that there is no loss in operational capacity due to natural disasters. That's the summary of the Amendment 664 uh, report on utility requirements on Guam, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Garcia, did you have an amendment? Yes. We'd be pleased to hear from you on the amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to all the members. Um, our service members represent the best of our country. As members of Congress, it is our duty to ensure that those who have served are currently serving and will serve in the future maintain access to those rights and protections going forward. This body has made significant strides in recent years legislating and overseeing improvements to protect and prevent sexual assault and abuse, but our kids are the most vulnerable. The New York Times released an article in July of 2022 
that uncovered the sexual abuse of teens in the Military Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps program and reported 33 JROTC instructors that were criminally charged. Again, they were criminally charged. The Department of Defense then acknowledged an unprecedented 58 instances of sexual abuse within the Junior ROTC program since 2017. Cadets enrolled in the Junior ROTC program face a unique challenge of a particularly uneven power dynamic, with their adult instructors also serving as their commanding officer. As a result, predators can leverage these power dynamics to coerce young victims, usually teenage girls, and commit acts of sexual abuse. According to the Child Molestation Research and Prevention Institute, 95% of sexual abuse is preventable through education. That means that direct access to sexual abuse prevention training is the most effective method of protecting our teen cadets. This is why I have added Amendment 718 to the NDAA bill to ensure that these abuses never happen again and that teens are, that are enrolled in these programs are protected. Amendment 718 requires the Department of Defense to provide annual age-appropriate sexual assault and abuse prevention trainings to junior ROTC teen cadets. Further, this amendment will ensure that the JROTC instructor cannot also be the person doing the annual training. As we say in Texas, you can't have the fox guarding the hen house. The lack of protection for junior ROTC teen cadets is not only a moral failing, but it also undermines military readiness. At a time when the United States is suffering from a recruitment crisis across the armed forces, our nation cannot afford to see a program as important as junior ROTC undermined and disgraced by, by growing accounts of sexual abuse. Congress has a fundamental duty to protect these teen cadets, and my amendment will do just that. I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to share this consequential legislation for the committee's consideration. I encourage all the members of this committee to give Amendment 718 serious consideration for inclusion in this year's NDAA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Does uh, the gentlelady actually have other amendments? No, sir, just this one. Okay, I have no questions. Mr. McGovern? I want to thank you both for being here. I support making your amendments in order. And, um, and uh, Ms. Garcia, I want to do everything I can to help uh, not to make it in order, but pass your amendment on the floor. So thank you. Well, thank you, sir. As you know, it's just tragic that these young people want to be in the Army, they want to be in the Air Force, they want, they want, they want to be in the military, to be uh, abused or assaulted at such a young age. I mean, these are teenage high school girls. It's, it's a tragedy. It shouldn't happen. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Uh, any other members have questions for this panel? Yes. Ms. Houchin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman Moylan, uh, thank you for coming to testify to the Rules Committee and to speak on your amendment. I appreciate your work as a member of the Armed Services Committee. Uh, you're a great member of our freshman class. Um, I want to thank you for your work advocating uh, for Guam in the wake of the typhoon. Uh, you've been a great advocate here in Con Congress for your constituents. You have also insisted that issues facing the Guam power grid are intertwined with national security. Uh, could you speak more to that link between the power grid and our own national security? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. I, yes. A Department of Defense presence in Guam is not restricted to only the military bases. There are military families who live off base in our communities that use the utilities from our local agency. Additionally, the military bases have off base buildings and installations that also draw from our local power grid. So if a natural disaster strikes Guam again, these operations will be left without power posing a major impediment to the operation capacity across Guam's military bases and community. We work as one. Our utility agencies are one with uh, provide the source of water and power uh, with our community and our military bases. We are projecting four more strong typhoons to come through Guam. Uh, this will be very helpful by uh, 
passing the Amendment 664 to report on the utilitarian requirements necessary in Guam. So thank you for the question. Thank, thank you, you Congressman. Um, thank you for your time and the work that you've done on behalf of Guam. We certainly appreciate you and uh, Guam uh, and our important military base there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Sure. Thanks, gentlelady. Gentlelady yields back. Are there any other members having questions for this panel? If not, uh, this panel is excused. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman? Okay. May I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the statements from Representatives Nikki Budzinski, uh, Gregorio Sablan, John Garamendi, Lloyd Doggett, and Barbara Lee, in support of their amendments. If you'll allow us to excuse. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you did. I'm sorry. I thought you did. You, you all are excused. Without objection, so ordered. Um, also, without objection, the following member statements will be inserted into the record. Uh, Representative Brian Babin, Representative Jim Baird, Representative Mike Garcia, Representative George Santos, Representative Chris Stewart, and Delegate James Moylan. At the table. Go ahead, sir. You ran right there. Thank you for joining us, uh, Mr. Molinero. I, we, we generally do this on order of appearance. I believe you came first. So I'm happy to yield. If no, the, no, no, we, no we're anxious to hear from you. I'm sure you are. I know that your time's precious and uh, it's going to be a busy day, but I just wanted to thank you. I've submitted a, a number of amendments uh, for consideration. I certainly thank the leadership of this committee, of course, House uh, Armed Services, uh, but I'd like to just touch on uh, four that are of specific uh, interest and concern uh, to those I represent. Uh, the first uh, two deal with uh, individuals with intellectual, physical, and developmental disabilities. Amendment number 596 uh, is specific to DOD-run schools, and this amendment ensures uh, parents of children with disabilities are made aware of their rights to bring an advocate to an individualized education program meeting. Now, as a parent of a child with a disability myself, I know firsthand the challenges and confusion that often come with working with schools to understand the process of creating an IEP and the rights entitled to children and families. Uh, there are an estimated 4.1 million parents in the United States having children with disabilities, including many, many military families. Now, parents have the right uh, to bring a third-party advocate, such as a therapist, lawyer, or knowledgeable family member, along with a community advocate, uh, to these very important meetings. Now, my amendment adds a section under the Parents' Bill of Rights found within the bill for service members and their families to ensure parents are made aware of this right. Additionally, Amendment 1069 requires a GAO study on the effectiveness of the Exceptional Family Member Program, uh, which currently supports individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, within our military families. My simple amendment requires a GAO, GAO study on the current effectiveness of the program to ensure the needs of military families with special needs uh, are met. And lastly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to touch on just two others uh, that address uh, the opioid epidemic affecting millions of Americans, including countless military uh, servicemen and women. Amendment 1066 requires the sec Secretary to provide periodic reports to Congress on how the DOD is ensuring full, adequate TRICARE coverage of Narcan, naloxone. For service members and their families. And with the FDA's approval of the uh, very first over-the-counter naloxone nasal spray, a life-saving emergency treatment that reverses opioid overdose, more lives can be saved, particularly among servicemen and women, veterans, and their families. My amendment asks the Secretary to inform Congress on TRICARE's coverage of this life-saving drug. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, Amendment 1124 requires an updated study on opioid prescribing to ensure health professionals in the military health system conform with clinical practice guidelines and other guidances uh, provided by the CDC and FDA. And this amendment ensures lawmakers are made aware of the current opioid prescribing measures and increases proper oversight to ensure the safety and well-being of our service members. Thousands continue to suffer fatal overdoses, and I, of course you agree we need to do all we can to reverse this disturbing trend to save lives. So, Mr. Chairman and members, I ask you to uh, consider not only these amendments, uh, but uh, the others uh, that I've uh, submitted, which address uh, student and service member mental health, small business family, uh, excuse me, small business fa fairness, military readiness, in-home and nursing care, and AI and biodefense. And these amendments will ensure our service members and their families are getting the best care and opportunities possible, as they rightfully deserve and have unquestionably earned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Mr. Malamero. Uh, Dr. Dunn, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank you for the opportunity to share two of my amendments with you and for your consideration of each. Uh, the First Amendment is on back pay for our troops, and the Second Amendment on prohibiting DOD contracts from being awarded to affiliates of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Jackson, and I introduced a Troop Bill Act over four and a half months ago. Dr. Jackson and I were among the first members to sound the alarm over the injustice our troops were facing for refusing a COVID-19 shot in the first place. I'm pleased that language similar to the Troop Act regarding the reinstatement was included in the House version of the NDAA that passed out of Hask. Unfortunately, language to provide back pay was not included in the chairman's mark. Uh, as a former military officer and trauma surgeon, I understand the sacrifices that our service members and their families make each and every day for the sake of our country and our freedoms. The, the amendment Dr. Jackson is, uh, joins me on, also Representative Darrell Issa and Andrew Clyde. Uh, this would provide back pay for those who decide to rejoin after being kicked out for refusing the vaccine, only those who decide to rejoin. Our service members' uh, lives were uprooted. They now deserve justice since the Biden vaccine max, uh, va mandate has been uh, lifted and SECDEF has rescinded his order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter also three uh, articles into the record. The first, the Army expects to miss its recruiting goals. Again, this year's second uh, top Air Force recruiter predicts uh, maintainer security forces shortages and the last is National Guard struggles to attract recruits as private sector offers Without tough competition order. for talent. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, during a time when our military needs to be at peak readiness, it is plagued by a severe recruiting crisis. Last year, the Army missed its recruiting goal by over 15,000 and expects a shortfall of 10,000 this year. Air Force expects a shortfall of 4,100 and the Navy 6,000. Our reserve forces are experiencing equal difficulty, if not worse. Colonel Anthony Pasquale, Division Chief of the Air National Guard Recruiting and Retention, told Stars and Stripes, this is the single most challenging recruiting environment the Department of Defense has ever faced. Uh, with retention and recruitment numbers so low, incentivizing senior enlisted officers to rejoin is simply uh, a return on our investment. Inclusion of this amendment will send a loud and clear message to our men and women in uniform that we have their back and that we will stand with them against misguided policies, and we need them now more than ever during this recruiting crisis to meet America's national security threats from Communist China and others. I'm proud of this amendment, and, uh, and I'm proud that it's uh, garnered so much support in Congress. My second amendment, as a member of the Select Committee just, on Just China, for clarification, was that 421 that you, that was, you were just speaking? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. My second amendment is as a member of the Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party, I've been pleased to see the bipartisan activity we have achieved under the leaderships of uh, Representative Gallagher and Krishna Murthy. Uh, from shedding light on the human rights abuses of the Uyghurs genocide to strategizing how we counter the CCP's economic aggression, the Select Committee has been working tirelessly on a bipartisan basis to develop a plan of action that defends the American people, our economy, and our values. Of particular importance was the tabletop exercise on Taiwan uh, that the committee participated in, the high-level strategic TTX examined a potential future conflict between the U.S. and China over Taiwan. This is a hypothetical situation that examined the potential diplomatic, economic, and military actions that the U.S. could take to defeat a Chinese attack on Taiwan. The simulation gave us a sense of where the U.S. military weaknesses may lie and the consequences for international trade and American business. The Chief of Naval Operations on multiple occasions has stated, China is the strategic threat to this country and that the time to act is now. I could not agree more with that statement. The bipartisan amendment I'm offering today is almost an exact replica of an amendment that already exists as part of last year's NDAA. My uh, <coughs> amendment prohibits new construction or repair contracts from being awarded to entities that are affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party. This amendment is a no-brainer. It is common sense, has already been passed previously, uh, and uh, currently enjoys uh, bipartisan support from over 20 members of Congress. 
I pledge to work diligently to continue building support for both amendments inclusion in the fiscal year 23 NDAA and I thank the committee for their consideration hope that you will consider including both amendments for your consideration thank you and it, just for clarification was that amendment number 90 it is thank you very much thank you dr. McCormick uh, you're recognized thank you Very good. Uh, the red light on. How many doctors does it take to turn on a microphone? I think it's a joke somewhere around here. All right, very good. There's only three of us here. We need one more. <laughs> Four. Four. <laughs> good. Well, that's why we figured out the microphone. Um, so thank you for allowing me to testify on my amendment, H.R. 2670, the Fiscal Year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act. I am a strong supporter of our assistance to Ukraine in their fight for uh, basically freedom against the Russians' illegally unprovoked invasion. For Ukraine to win this war, 100% of the aid we provide must reach its intended destination and serve its intended purpose. Moreover, we have an obligation to the American people to demonstrate the integrity of our assistance to Ukraine. Failure to do so could cause the American public to lose confidence in these war efforts, which would only benefit Vladimir Putin. As a guy who, just like anybody else who made the rank of major or above uh, field grade, we all had to go to clan and staff. And one thing we notice is that uh, there's two things that lose wars, bad tactics and loss of popular support. Popular support is one thing we can't control uh, politically if we do the wrong thing. And uh, that's why this bill is so important. Uh, we owe it to the American taxpayer and to their legitimate support of this effort uh, and our Ukrainian partners to exert strict oversight in this aid to ensure that we spend American taxpayer dollars responsibly. Uh, currently, the Inspector General for the Department of Defense, Department of State, and USAID coordinate to conduct this oversight, but they need more help. They need to codify a cooperative framework, establish standards and deadlines, and they must have hiring authority to fulfill their mission. That doesn't exist right now, by the way. As a matter of fact, in order to hire these same people, it takes months and months, maybe even years, to hire them if we don't have something like this codified. Uh, my amendment, based on the Ukraine Aid Oversight Act, which I recently introduced, meets this objective. In Section 1221, it gives the Department of State and USAID Inspectors General flexible hiring authority, including easier reemployment of uh, people we need for these uh, jobs to meet their staffing goals for the purpose of their coordination and reports. Uh, the amendment further caps appointments under the Section 45 provisions per IG per year. The flexible hiring authority will sunset when the budget for Ukraine responsive activities is less than $1 billion in a fiscal year. So it has a defined process. Under the current law, inspector generals can only obtain this flexible hiring authority if the United States is an active state of war. To be clear, that means unless we deliver this authority, via the NDAA, they will not get it and not will be able to have that oversight legally. With that, I yield to questions. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Westerman, is recognized to testify on his amendment. Four amendments. Thank you, Chairman Cole. Ranking Member McGovern, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the Fiscal Year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act, and I would like to discuss three issues I feel are necessary for this committee to include in the Fiscal Year 24 NDAA. Let me start with COVID-19 infection and vaccination in the U.S. Armed Forces Act number 815. First, I would like to ask the committee to make an order my amendment requiring a Department of Defense study on the immune response levels of service members to COVID-19 infection and vaccination. This is about our service members' health and readiness, as well as their faith in the institution charged to protect them. We owe it to our men and women in uniform to understand the performance of the vaccine, <clears throat> the impact of previous infection on the efficacy of coronavirus vaccines, and the result of infection and immunity on the body. Additionally, the research conducted by DOD plays a vital role in informing healthcare decisions not only for our troops, but for civilians and people around the globe. DOD is uniquely positioned to answer many of the questions that service members and civilians alike 
have about vaccine and natural immunity efficacy. In August 2022, I led a letter to the Department of Defense signed by 20 members of Congress with medical backgrounds asking for basic information on whether the DOD was conducting research and studies on service members' immune response to COVID-19 vaccines and immunization and the efficacy of vaccines and prior infection for COVID-19 prevention. I did not receive a response until January 2023, five months. That response rate is unacceptable. Even more disappointing is the fact that the department did not answer all the questions in the inquiry. I wrote the department again in February, asking for more details, only to receive incomplete and evasive responses. The letter came three months later in May. My amendment would help ensure that the DOD is conducting this important and necessary research by requiring a study to test the blood of service members to collect data on the immune response generated by the COVID-19 vaccines, as well as prior infections. Were you vaccinated? Which vaccine? When were you vaccinated? Did you get COVID? When did you get COVID? Were you ever vaccinated and got COVID? Those are the questions that would go with the data that we would want to retrieve. I asked the, the committee make my amendment in order so that the full House can give its consideration to this important issue. It's time we give full transparency on this topic to the American people and all our incredible servicemen and service women. Next, <clears throat> on codifying the Afghan Allies Protection Act of 2023, number 1295. I urge this committee to make in order a bipartisan amendment I'm leading with Representative Jason Crow, which would help the United States honor its promises to our Afghan partners who supported our efforts in Afghanistan over two decades. This amendment, based on the text of the Afghan Allies Protection Act of 2023, would create transparency in the Afghan special immigration visa process, SIV process, by requiring the State Department to publish their strategy for addressing the persistent delays and the backlog within the system so that our Afghan partners who assisted U.S. troops and diplomats during the 20-year-long war in Afghanistan can obtain visas. They worked for us, and many died with us. Specifically, the amendment would extend the SIV application period from 2024 to 2029, allowing for virtual interviews and provide reimbursement for medical exams to Afghans experiencing financial hardship. I urge my colleagues on the committee to follow through on our obligation to the Afghan people and show the world that as Americans, when we make a promise, we keep it. Lastly, the role of surgeons in the armed forces, number 1444. I would like to express my strong desire to see my amendment number 1444 included in the fiscal year 24 NDAA. This amendment would revise the Defense Health Agency's policy regarding credentialing and privileging under the military health system to include certifying boards recognized by organizations such as the American Board of Medical Specialties, the American Osteopathic Association, the American Board of Physician Specialties Council, the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, the American Board of Pain Medicine, and the certifying boards approved by the Council on Podiatric Medical Education. Recruiting and retaining the best and brightest physicians to the armed forces is of utmost importance to the health and well-being of our military's greatest asset, our people. Every medical professional serving in uniform must have the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed to serve our people well when engaging fully in the operational mission. Today, the military faces a tremendous shortage of surgeons, and it's essential that surgeons in the armed forces meet the highest possible standard and have the training and certification needed to indicate that they are prepared for the operational mission. I urge the committee to make this amendment and my other amendments in order. And I will add that I do come by this firsthand. As many of you know, I served one year, 2005-2006, in Iraq as Chief of Surgery for Combat Support Hospital, stationed at Abu Ghraib, not only taking care of our troops, but taking care of the enemy. These are some of the deficiencies that I have seen 
And these are some of the problems, I think, in military medicine that we can rectify and make our military medicine the best in the world. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith, I'll invite you up as well. You can join this panel. There's a seat for you there. The gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. Green, is recognized for uh, whatever amendments she cares to discuss. Thank you, Chairman Cole. I appreciate it. Um, as the proud daughter of a former uh, United States uh, Navy man uh, who served in the Vietnam War, um, I just want to say I, I really want to support the NDAA. Uh, but I have some amendments that I'd like to bring forward. I filed six amendments, which I would ask the Rules Committee to consider. Amendment 103 prohibits Ukraine funding until a diplomatic solution to the war is reached. My amendment prohibits funds from being provided to Ukraine until the president certifies to Congress that a diplomatic solution has been achieved to the war. President Biden's decision to send billions of dollars worth of weapons and aid to Ukraine has engaged the United States in a proxy war with Russia that we cannot afford and jeopardizes all peace efforts. Instead of funding an endless war overseas, the United States should seek a peaceful end to the conflict, which will save lives. And I brought this as a printout. It's a copy from the Department of Defense on what our Department of Defense mission is. It reads, we are your defense. The Department of Defense is America's largest government agency. With our military tracing its roots back to pre-revolutionary times, the department has grown and evolved with our nation. Our mission is to provide the military forces needed to deter war and ensure our nation's security. Those are two things that is the mission for the Department of Defense, deter war and ensure our nation's security. Funding a war in Ukraine does neither one of those. And this is why there should be no funding for a war in Ukraine um, that does not meet the mission of the Department of Defense. The next amendment, Amendment 104, strikes the feasibility study on establishing a center of excellence in Ukraine. My amendment reorients our national defense policies and priorities towards America first. The U.S. should not be collaborating with the government of Ukraine to establish any center in Ukraine, regardless of the purpose. Although I sympathize greatly with those who have experienced traumatic brain injuries and amputations, we have American veterans who have experienced traumatic brain injuries as well as amputations. We should not be devoting time and resources in putting the people of Ukraine over American citizens and over American veterans. We should be only helping our American citizens first. The next amendment I have is Amendment 105, strikes 300 million of Ukraine funding. This bill includes 300 million in additional funding for Ukraine. My amendment would eliminate this provision. According to the Congressional Research Service, in 2022, the United States provided a total of 113 billion in funding to Ukraine. The essentially open-ended support provided to Ukraine by Joe Biden is unsustainable, increases the risk of a direct conflict with a nuclear-armed Russia, and distracts from more urgent national security pr priorities. Congress should not authorize another penny for Ukraine and push the Biden administration to pursue peace. And again, I would like to remind everyone what the mission of the Department of Defense is. It states it on their website. And that is, our mission is to provide the military forces needed to deter war and ensure our nation's security. That's for America's national security, not Ukraine. Ukraine is not the 51st state of the United States of America. Amendment number six directs the president to withdraw the U.S. from NATO. My amendment would direct the president withdrawal from NATO. They are not a reliable partner whose defense spending should be paid for by American citizens. For the better part of the last decade, Germany has contributed only around 1% of its GDP to finance NATO obligations, while the United States is paying around 4% of our GDP to defend NATO countries. The United States has been financing and promising to defend NATO countries for decades and paying more than its fair share. 
Western European countries could and should be stepping up their financial contributions to ensure the security of NATO. Instead, they are entirely beholden to Russia, and the U.S. taxpayer is expected to foot the bill. Amendment number 110 prohibits the provision of F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. My amendment would prohibit the U.S. from sending F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. Providing F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine will not only deplete our own fighter fleet, but it will escalate the proxy war with Russia, which is a nuclear power, rather than implementing diplomatic solutions. Again, we should not be funding war. We should be pushing for peace. Amendment number 113 prohibits the provision of long-range missiles to Ukraine. My amendment prohibits the U.S. from sending long-range missiles to Ukraine. Providing long-range missiles to Ukraine will further implicate the U.S. in a war with Russia. U.S. weapons being fired into Russian territory is an unprecedented disaster that will insert the United States into World War III and be catastrophic for our country. And we all need to remind ourselves that China now has a military base on Cuba, which is 90 miles from Florida. Do we want China to have long-range missile, long missiles on Cuba that they can fire into the United States? I know the American people do not want that. Um, I, I urge the committee to have, ask any questions that you have, but I also urge the committee to please pass my amendments. And I remind the committee that in, in our Congress, if there needs to be a supplemental bill for support for Ukraine, I ask that funding for Ukraine, funding for weapons for Ukraine, be a separate bill, but not be shoved into the NDAA where it forces people like me to say, I'm sorry, I cannot vote for the NDAA because it's supporting war in a foreign country, but not supporting the defense of our country. Um, I think we should all remind ourselves that with over 300 Americans dying every single day from fentanyl, the, the enemy we should be concerned about is not about the borders and the defense of Ukraine against Russian aggression. We should be more concerned about the Mexican cartels who are killing Americans every single day. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith, recognized to discuss any amendments he cares to bring up. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to focus on two amendments, if I could. <clears throat> Pardon me. The first has to do with ocean wind power. Uh, off the coast of New Jersey and upwards the coast into Long Island and a little further north, there's a proposal for 3,400 ocean wind turbines. Unfortunately, the due diligence that you would expect to have been done with regards to uh, the impact on the ecosystem the impacts on uh, whales, for example, the, who have died in unprecedented numbers, uh, and a lot of other issues have not been adequately addressed by BOEM or other agencies. But one of the areas that I have focused on, in addition to all of that, is the fact that radars and sonar are very significantly and negatively impacted uh, by wind turbines, so much so that we believe based on a, a um, National Academy of Sciences report from 2022, uh, that we will have situations where the ships that are vessels, whether it be military or, or commercial or fishing boats, will not see each other. They'll, see, they'll get false images presented on their radar. The ability to detect what is underwater, whether it be uh, uh, submarines or anything else, uh, will be also a problem, a serious problem. And I'll just quote very briefly uh, from from uh, the BOM stu from the uh, uh, the study from the National Academy of Sciences, it said that wind turbine generators lead to interference in marine vessel radar and will frequently lead to unintended consequences of suppressing detection of small targets like boats or buoys or creating misleading images on radar screens. And ominously, this Academy of Sciences report said wind turbine generation mitigation techniques have not been substantially investigated, implemented, matured, or deployed. We are making ourselves blind, if all of this is true, on the coast of New Jersey, north and south, to our uh, states uh, that are also going to be subjected to this huge, huge 3,400 infrastructure uh, um, made by foreign companies that are demanding tax subsidies, and they're getting them now. My point is, we need to know, does this hurt, degrade, 
or in any way impair our military capability to know what's going on. My amendment would task and require the Secretary of Defense uh, to certify in writing that offshore wind projects in the North Atlantic and Mid-Atlantic planning areas will not weaken, degrade, interfere with, or nullify the capability of radar and sonar relied upon by the armed services, and also whether or not it will affect training and any other military operations. It is one big, fat, open question. Uh, I think the evidence clearly suggests that we are blinding ourselves to adversaries. Uh, but if I'm wrong, anybody who is for the ocean wind development should say we should at least know with certainty and have the Secretary of Defense certify uh, one way or the other that it's a problem or that it's not a problem. The Second Amendment deals with, you might recall, Mr. Chairman, uh, I had an amendment on the NDA last Congress that became law uh, dealing with the SEALs training. A member of my uh, constituency, a young man, uh, Kyle, was killed during Hell Week, at the end of Hell Week, during SEALs training, and he did not, I say again, did not get medical attention. So much so that when we demanded that there be an investigation, the investigation came back, and his mother has been probably the most tenacious of all. She's a nurse. She said there were symptoms uh, throwing up blood and other things that clearly suggested he needed medical attention. He didn't get it. So we did an amendment that said basically there has to be uh, a brand new effort to make sure the well-being and welfare of those SEALs candidates uh, are protected. Well, to their credit, the Navy has implemented that, and I'm happy to say uh, there have been substantial improvements uh, with regards to um, the medical oversight. Uh, but this amendment would go even further and make sure that the BUDS training uh, in no way um, unnecessarily puts our men at risk during this training, particularly during Hell Week, uh, and, and we would call for a report. So um, those two amendments I'm asking be, uh, respectfully be made in order. I thank you all for your testimony. The chair has no questions. The gentleman from Texas, uh, have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Smith, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing forth that very important question. I have been concerned. Uh, of course, I also serve on the Committee on Energy and Commerce, and the the investment that this country is making into offshore wind is uh, is stunning, and no one knows if it's going to work. You're raising valid questions about are there effects that we of which we do not know. It's like we didn't learn the lessons from Cape Wind back in, <laughs> 20 years ago when that large scale project never got off the ground in spite of a significant infusion of federal dollars. So I, I appreciate you bringing it forward. I, I hope uh, your amendment can be made in order when we we do the bill. Brad, uh, Dr. Winstrup, let me just ask you a question. I think I probably signed that letter that you, uh, that you sent. Now, is this information that you're gathering, uh, is, this will be vo a voluntary on the part of the service, service members, the uh, assessment of their, of their uh, immune status and the questionnaire that they would have to answer? I really hadn't considered that component. I'm, I'm okay with it being voluntary because, you know, these people in the Army are used to giving blood. I don't think they'd hesitate uh, because many times you are giving blood, drawing blood non-voluntarily. So I do think that uh, we would get a large response, but uh, we may want to work that in to be non-voluntary. had enough mandates. Very well. Well, thank you all for, for bringing your amendments today. They're all important, and uh, appreciate you sharing them with us. Thank you. Gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for any questions she may have. Thank you. No, I just wanted to thank uh, Representative Wenstrup for his work on behalf of the Afghan SIVs. That's something I've worked on for a long time as well, and it, the process is just so broken. So thank you. Gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank each of you for, for testifying and bringing your amendments forward. Congressman Smith, the, um, I appreciate you highlighting what's going on in New Jersey. Uh, they are sticking it to the taxpayers, particularly the electric uh, users that I don't think expected this. You're going to have a mass exodus of, of people from New Jersey if this stays into effect. I appreciate you bringing it to the forefront. Thank you. And uh, hope you keep doing it. Yo, Ralph, back. Could I just comment very briefly yes, on that, if I could? No, certainly. Um, right just here. this week, last week, the governor signed legislation, unfortunately it was partisan, that states that the company, it's called Orsted, uh, will get 
tax credits, and if, if construction begins on or before January 2026, uh, they are in line to get 30% plus of all the construction costs borne by the U.S. taxpayer. That was in the Inflation Control Act, that deadline to, to put that in there. So they're hurrying up this process in a way that is unconscionable. And so just this past week, the governor signed legislation, Governor Murphy, that bypasses passing on any reductions that the tax credit might give to the ratepayer and allows Orsted to keep it all. So they're, they're, there's a money grab, a blank check being given to them. Like you just said, this is going to cost an enormous amount of money. It's going to do irreparable damage to our coast, uh, to our ecosystem, like I said before. Uh, but this, this amendment goes to something that almost no one's focusing on. And I asked the director Klein of Bohm at a hearing, asked her, what about all of this with regards to radars being impaired and, and, and degraded? She said, well, we clear it with the DOD. I called the DOD. I can't get any answers. Zero, zilch, crickets, uh, as to whether or not they will say and certify, yeah, it's not going to hurt our ability to defend our shoreline. And so it, it's, it's a debacle in the making. We've got to do everything we can. Now, if Secretary Austin, if he's still uh, Secretary of Defense when this is all signed, uh, is going to certify that it does not degrade our ability to use sonar and radar um, to defend our coast and also to, to enable our, our navigation, uh, then he puts his name to it. But we, we don't have answers. And unfortunately, the press aren't asking the kind of questions that they should. Uh, so I really hope this is made in order, and I thank you for your comment. It's, pretty, about it's pure and simple. Ortho, from what I understand, it's a no-bid contract. Uh, they had put a price on it, and then after the fact came back and said they exactly. needed more money. You don't do that in business. And oh, here's the other thing. The Legislative General Assembly does a legislative briefing note, and when they ask the governor how much is all this going to cost, Big fat blanks, and it says no estimate received. So we have they're they're blind. We have no idea what the cost is. One estimate was just for this first segment, which is 98 wind wind um, uh, generators or, or turbines, is uh, about a billion dollars. So the taxpayer will get hit, all of us, because it covers the whole country, and the ratepayers in New Jersey will be doubly hit uh, because it's it's been totally estimated by the division, um, uh, a separate. Uh, division of the uh, state government that we are going to see higher payments for our energy because of this. Well, I don't think it's blind. I think they're doing it to. This is a close, this is an in-house deal that every American. This ought to be on all of our websites. What's happening in New Jersey? Uh, we're all a border border state at some point. This is about as as much graft and greed as I've I've seen in a long time. So thank you for your work on this. Thank I you yield so back, thank you. Chairman. Thank you. Gentlelady from Indiana is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm glad to see fellow freshman members of Congress, uh, Representative McCormick and Molinaro, on the panel as witnesses on your amendments. I do have a couple of questions for both of you. Representative McCormick, um, I want to specifically talk about proper oversight of tax dollars. So on that topic, um, why is providing the Inspector General for USAID Department of State, Department of Defense, providing them flexible hiring authority. Why is that important for the overall mission of ensuring the proper use of funds in Ukraine? I know you touched on that, but can you expand on uh, why that matters to the proper use of funds in Ukraine? Sure. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we all agree that the OIGs are, are, are a very important part in oversight. The reason it's important, uh, here's Max wants to know about this right now, apparently. Uh, the reason that it's really important in oversight, it, it, the way it's designed right now, it takes months to hire these people for oversight. Uh, this streamlines the process so that you have flexible hiring standards and you can get the people on the ground in the place they need to be right away without uh, the, the hampering right now because literally it could take 18 months to hire the very people that need to have oversight. This thing could be over by that time, God willing. Uh, and, and this gives them, the, the IGs, the flexibility to fill these on-ground necessary roles as fast as possible, and that's why it's imperative. And that's to get proper oversight over the use of any funds that we're expending in Ukraine? That's correct. So if the, the American people are to have uh, any continued support of this, they, they have to understand that the funds are going exactly where they're supposed to go. Thank you. And to Representative Molinaro, um, I'm very interested. I'm also a parent of a child on an IEP, so I, I just wanted you to touch a little bit on your amendment 596, the need for families to be able to bring an advocate to these uh, individualized education 
plan meetings. Why is that an important part of the NDAA? I appreciate that. Uh, first, uh, with over 4 million American families uh, with children with disabilities, uh, the challenges have been mounting, certainly post-COVID. Uh, the uh, reduction in, in service access to services, therapies, et cetera, become more and more challenging. When Congress adopted IDEA, it, it, it established a very important foundation that children with disabilities would have the most appropriate educational opportunities. Uh, why within the NDAA? Well, because the DOD administers uh, uh, school programming for military families. Now, add to that the burden that military families have moving, relocating, deploying, uh, and just the stresses of, of managing uh, home life. Uh, having uh, uh, a military family with a child with disability, countless, countless numbers of them, uh, knowing firsthand that they have a right to an advocate in those meetings will relieve the family of that pressure uh, and ensure that DOD-related uh, schools, administered schools, are providing the adequate education necessary for children with disabilities. And as part of that, just that it, it's a complex process, um, making sure that, and it's a balance to make sure that children are properly accommodated but not overly accommodated. Um, so that their true abilities can shine through. Um, having an advocate there to help parents sort of uh, weed through that very complex process, um, is that one of the reasons that it's important? Well, you said it uh, as well as I could, but uh, yes, layer upon layer of administration bureaucracy has made it very difficult for families to know what services are appropriate and what opportunities would be uh, appropriate for their children. This ensures that someone who knows the system is advocating for the family, most importantly the student, uh, in particular within DOD administered schools. And on Amendment 451, um, why should mental health checkups uh, also include students with intellectual and development, developmental disabilities? What can we know about, what do you know, what can you speak about the importance of including that? Well, for the same reasons I, I, I spoke about the previous amendment, uh, in, in particular families uh, deployed, traveling, et cetera, deal with a, a significant amount of stress, some trauma. Mm -hmm. Uh, those with disabilities uh, are often uh, facing mental wellness concerns, but often not diagnosed. And so ensuring that, uh, in particular, children with disabilities are included in those mental health uh, checks uh, is important, not only for the family to, to, to be certain that they're aware of what services uh, or support the child might need, uh, but that the system acknowledges and DOD acknowledges what resources are necessary to help young people deal with perhaps the trauma, the anxiety, the stress, that they may deal with so that they can advance more successfully. Thank you, and I'm working on some legislation for math and reading literacy that will delve into the IDEA, so if you'd like to talk further about uh, these provisions as part of that package, I'd be happy to discuss it. Happy to do that, not here. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I yield back. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for the panel? Uh, if not, thank all of you for coming before us today. The witnesses are excused. And we'll uh, call up our thank you. next panel, uh, Representative James, Representative Rosendale, Representative Davidson, Representative Foster, Representative Gates, and Representative Johnson. Okay, if we can, thank all of you for coming for us. We'll just make this easy and work from my left to my right. So, Representative Davidson, we'll start with you for whatever uh, amendments you care to testify about. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you to uh, everyone on the Rules Committee, including those who are, are listening in while they're multitasking on everything else. Uh, we do appreciate the work you guys do, and uh, when we look at the number of amendments, appreciate the daunting challenge uh, that you confront. Um, and uh, it, it certainly isn't lost on you how, how touchy the rule is on this particular path. So hopefully we can find a constructive path uh, to something that will, will get us uh, where we all want to be, which is on a, an, on a Defense Authorization Act that we can all support. Uh, so hard challenge. 
Um, I've offered a number of amendments. I think they're all germane uh, under the first set of conditions. I hear rumors that there may be other conditions applied. I hope not. Uh, but I'd like to emphasize four. So let me start with the first one. Uh, and to me, you know, the most important one I've proposed is uh, number 1375. So this amendment would prevent the government from purchasing data that would otherwise require a warrant. It curtails warrantless surveillance under FISA and ends unauthorized surveillance practices. So the government uh, has been, and DOD in particular, has been circumventing the Fourth Amendment by purchasing location data, internet browsing data, and other sensitive information. The data broker loophole is a severe threat to the right to privacy in the United States. Uh, and frankly, a Louisiana judge just agreed by canceling uh, their ability uh, to, to influence speech. Well, the precursor to canceling speech is the privacy violation. So first they find out who's saying what, and then they go after the speech itself. Uh, and they do all sorts of other things with that privacy data. The government should not be doing this. We didn't authorize them to do it. And they're using funds that we appropriate to them for this purpose. And uh, this amendment gives us a chance to turn it off. Uh, government surveillance programs are routinely misused and target Americans. Uh, the FBI conducted 278,000 improper searches, and that's by their disclosure, uh, in 2020 alone. Uh, and the government uh, shouldn't be able to buy their way around the Fourth Amendment. So that's the basic amendment there. Um, next is um, Amendment Number 472, and this amendment prohibits funding to Ukraine which there's $300 million in this bill for um, if uh, until the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State, in coordination with the Commander-in-Chief, develop and submit to Congress a report detailing the strategy for U.S. involvement in Ukraine. They haven't defined a mission. And it seems like that's the first thing. You know, ready, aim, fire is the sequence for a reason. And when you don't define a mission, you can't hold anyone, anyone accountable for for failure or for success. And frankly, to be honest, we can't properly allocate resources. If the mission is regime change in Russia, well, they clearly don't have enough resources. Uh, if the mission's something short of that, are we properly putting the amount of resources in the bill? They don't want the accountability. And it's incredibly important that we vote on this. And it can't just be, um, you know, no teeth. Why do the funds have to be ex at stake? Because we've written letters, we've asked them nicely, now we have to ask them nicely with consequences. And the reality is they do have a mission. They just don't want to verbalize it anywhere, even in the most classified setting. This bill doesn't say you have to make it public. You don't have to take an ad out in the New York Times. You don't have to email Vladimir Putin. But you've got to have a damn mission. Uh, that's, a, that's a basic uh, requirement. The next thing uh, is uh, amendment number 450. The amendment reduces. Um, that provides accountability for uh, DOD to pass an audit. No public company would stay listed if they can't pass an audit. We continue to reward DOD with more money, despite their ongoing failure to pass audits. And uh, my amendment simply says, if you don't pass an audit, we're going to help you reduce the number of general officers you have. Two, three, and four-star general billets would be reduced by 10% in a year they don't pass an audit. And frankly, they have too many generals anyway. Uh, the, you know, the officer ratio is 1 to 9 right now. It used to be 1 to 30. So we're top heavy, uh, and they're clearly not being productive because they can't pass an audit. I could go on in all the other ways they're not productive. We got all kinds of amendments about all the other things that they're wasting time and resources on instead of focusing on why we have a Department of Defense, which is to prepare for and fight and win wars for our country. Uh, and so they need to be laser focused on that. But they should be able to account for the money that they spend. The last one I want to emphasize um, uh, is, is also part of providing that focus. The amendment requires the Secretary of Defense to submit to Congress a report on allied contributions to defense spending. This is being offered in the Senate as well by Senator Lee. Um, the 1985 NDAA established an annual report from DOD on allied contributions uh, to the common defense with the initial focus on NATO allies. In 2004, the DOD stopped producing this report as the Pentagon's priority shifted towards the war on terror. Uh, however, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has renewed the need for this report. Our stockpiles are rapidly depleting. 
and we are $113 billion uh, deep officially into Ukraine, with no defined mission, I might add. Uh, since 2006, the majority of our NATO allies have consistently failed to meet their 2% defense uh, commitment. Even as a war is taking place in their own backyard, the United States remains the largest contributor uh, to defense of Ukraine, the, uh, which is not and should not be a member of NATO. Uh, the U.S. should not continue to uh, subsidize uh, the lack of investment by NATO member countries, and fundamentally, uh, we are doing that with certain provisions in this bill, including, uh, you know, funding for innovation that NATO countries aren't funding on their own. So. Uh, those are four amendments. I think they're, they're the four most important I proposed, uh, and, of course, I'm, I'm partial to all of them. With that, I yield. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Gates, you're recognized for any testimony you care to present. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always good to be back in the Friendly Rules Committee. I have six buckets of amendments that I'm going to talk about. The first deals with radical gender ideology in the military. There is nothing in the underlying bill that fixes the issues of radical gender ideology permeating the Department of Defense. My First Amendment dealing with that matter is Amendment Number 305. Amendment 305 deals with the Exceptional Family Member Program. The Exceptional Family Member Program is a wonderful program that allows service members to stay close to medical care for their family. For example, if someone was serving at the Pentagon and they had a child that was getting, uh, uh, seeing a special doctor for cardiology at Johns Hopkins, they would be able to block a permanent change of station based on that family member's medical circumstances. But bizarrely, the radical gender warriors have now seized control of the exceptional family member program, a good thing, in order to block change of station to any state that the woke DOD officials believe doesn't adhere to this full embrace of, uh, of gender concepts that are not embraced everywhere. I, I would enter into the record to showcase this, uh, a piece by the Huffington Post on April 13th, 2022, entitled Air objection. Force Officers to, to Help Military Families Hurt by State's New Anti-LGBTQ Laws. So what the amendment does is it says if you want to block a permanent change of station based on sexual orientation or gender identity, you have to show that someone has been found to have violated the federal laws that, ex that relate to discrimination under the color of law. If you can't prove that there's been a violation under the color of law, you won't be able to just block your transfer to Texas or Oklahoma or South Carolina or Florida just because uh, that is a concern of yours. So I really encourage you to approve Amendment 305. The second that deals with radical gender ideology is Amendment number 333, and this deals with the use of certain DOD facilities. And I'm somewhat embarrassed I have to even offer this amendment, but I've received a number of complaints from female service members in my district who do not want to shower with other people who have male genitalia. And uh, that is being required. I have, uh, for the record, uh, a number of pieces. I'll, I'll submit those, Mr. Chairman, at the, at the committee's um, acceptance. But the, but the amendment that I would offer would say that you use the shower and locker facilities of your gender assigned at birth. And it seems so obvious it, it should probably be the way it's being dealt with now. But this is the direct consequence of feedback from female service members. And the committee did take testimony on this point. And we had, the, uh, we had General McGonville of the Army come in and say that it would most certainly hurt recruiting with young women to be, if these uh, circumstances continue to present where women are having to shower with biological men. On to my third and final gender ideology amendment. Uh, I don't believe that the military should pay for people's gender reassignment surgeries. They cost over 200000 and there was one analysis done of $15 million that was spent by DOD on this gender reassignment, and about $3 million was spent on the actual surgeries, and then the remaining roughly $12 million was spent on all of the psychological care that is required for people who are suffering from gender dysphoria. I think if people want to realign their gender, they have every right to do so in this country. I don't think it should be a priority of the Department of Defense to pay for it. And that is why I've offered Amendment Number 320 on that point. Uh, the second uh, bucket of issues I want to deal with, and I know it's a, a sensitive one, is abortion. And I know people have very different views on abortion. And I know that when it comes to, uh, you know, various transit and travel, there'll be issues that deal with that. But my amendment precisely targets 
how abortion policy intersects with billeting and where service members are sent. Uh, we, the committee has developed evidence, and we have seen in public reporting that people are able to say that they're not going to go to a particular state that has military mission because they don't like that state's abortion policy. So regardless of how people feel about abortion, and I think reasonable people can disagree on this subject, I don't think that we should say that specific missions in red states should not be filled with billets and with people based on abortion policy. We should divorce those questions, but unfortunately they're being, uh, they're being merged now and we're seeing that play out not only in uh, the fulfillment of mission that occurs regularly, but even the selection of the U where the U.S. Space Command will be. There's been uh, indication that, that that's a factor. I just don't think abortion should be a factor in basing decisions. That's amendment number 285. Third basket, DEI. I want to commend the committee's work on, on this point, particularly Chairman Banks and the Military Personnel Subcommittee. We have taken a meat cleaver to DEI already in the underlying bill. The unfinished work is Amendment 314, which I've offered, which ends all DEI funding. Already in the base bill, we say that there can be no critical race theory pedagogy in any form of training at any of our service academies. We already say that senior DEI officials can't make these exorbitant salaries, uh, but this would simply wipe that out altogether. And there's a, re there's a reason for that. The DEI experiment in our military ha has failed. We recall the first act of Secretary Austin was this white supremacy stand down. But now we've seen reporting that that was resisted so heavily by service members. That was such a negative thing for cohesion and unity that they've actually tried to de-emphasize the white supremacy snipe hunt that they seem to be on. The second manifestation of this DEI in our military that I want to draw attention to is the promotion packets. When Secretary Austin took his position, he initially required the removal of photographs from officer promotion packets because his assertion was that if you had a photograph on a promotion packet and the person was of a different race or color or creed than you, that you would have some implicit inherent bias against that person. And so under the guise of DEI, we then removed all the photos from the promotion packets. And did the officer corps become more diverse? No, it became less diverse. And so Secretary Austin had to go reverse that decision he had previously made. L let us liberate ourselves from these flawed decisions and the cancerous doctrine of, of DEI. Finally, the committee developed evidence particularly about how DEI is harmful in the DOD's education mission. When we put up the tweets and messages that some of these DEI officials had had, they said that white people should not be able to claim that anyone else is racist other than white people. They talked about being Caucasian being something that caused people to, just, just being Caucasian caused you to discriminate against others. And Secretary Austin and General Milley and the other DEI proponents at DOD were so embarrassed by this, after the testimony, they literally shut down the entire program at Dodoa. So if that's happening there, it is metastasized across the enterprise of, of DOD, and that is why Amendment 314 is so important. The fourth uh, bucket that I would, I would draw the committee's attention to is the COVID reinstatement matter. I have Amendment number 296 that would give the Secretary 180 days to reinstate all those who sought reinstatement with the restoration of their pay and their rank, and it would provide a flat $15,000 hardship bonus for those who've seen their lives uh, turned upside down by a COVID mandate that was never founded in science and obviously has been rescinded as a consequence of the inability to continue to defend it. We lost 8,600 service members. We lost hundreds of special operators. We lost over 700 pilots. Our military is not stronger today because of the COVID vaccine mandate. It is weaker today. And anyone who is being honest would have to uh, ascribe to that fact. Uh, the fourth area that I want to talk about was uh, the issue of, of civil liberties. Uh, and I have three amendments on uh, civil liberties. There is something that exists called the, called the Joint Staff Civil Disturbance Cell. And I've been on the Armed Services Committee for seven years. I had never heard of the Joint Staff Civil Disturbance Cell until they started labeling the social media content of members of Congress <laughs> as extremist. So, so that you know this, the DOD today funds a domestic entity that tries to dictate what content online is true or false. And just as we oppose a ministry of truth in DHS, we similarly oppose a ministry of truth in DOD. 
and I want to submit for the record um, a piece from Trimix.com that highlights a social media post from Congresswoman Green and Congresswoman Boebert. Without objection. Thank you. And in this report, the, the tweets aren't, aren't particularly grievous. Ms. Green's tweet says that she woke up laughing about what a bunch of moron Democrats are giving free time to someone for, that Democrat tyrannical government uh, is problematic, conservatives have no say on committees. Uh, editorial, no doubt, but dangerous, probably not. Uh, Ms. Boebert issued a tweet uh, talking about uh, just criticizing Secretary Austin's extremism stand down. A stand down, the, the policy of, uh, that undergirded that stand down has subsequently been abandoned by the Department of Defense. But because Ms. Boebert offered a criticism, a DOD entity labeled her as extremist. Look, the Department of Defense does not have a constitutional mandate or the responsibility to label speech as credible or illegitimate, yet they are doing it anyway. This uh, amendment would abolish the funding for the civil disturbance spell cell and would, in, would have the, uh, the DOD focused on their core mission. That amendment number is uh, 1423. Uh, the, the next uh, civil liberties amendment I have is amendment number 339, and this is an amendment to require a unanimous verdict under the UCMJ. This is a very important amendment. And this amendment would have been adopted in committee uh, on a bipartisan basis, except get this. Because the <coughs> presumption of a unanimous jury verdict is that fewer people would be convicted, CBO says that my amendment violate, would, would have violated PAYGO because more people would have been acquitted. The government wouldn't have been able to charge as many fines associated with people associated with people's conviction. So because of that tortured interpretation of PAYGO, I was unable to get this, this really important amendment to update the UCMJ included. Any of us wouldn't want to see ourselves, our family members, our constituents subjected to a circumstance where a three-fourths requirement rather than a unanimous uh, verdict would create a miscarriage of, of justice. And so I would implore you to assist me see past the CBO's ludicrousy on that point. And uh, the final civil liberty amendment I have is Amendment 317 relating to cannabis. I do not believe we should be testing for cannabis for people who want to join the military. We have seen cannabis policy at the federal level awry for a long time, and we should be thinking about cannabis more in terms of alcohol. And because cannabis stays in the system so much longer than other drugs, someone cannot be, even be a drug user uh, with great proximity to their desire to enlist or commission, and yet can deem themselves somehow ineligible to serve. We are having a recruiting crisis. Under most states in this country, people use cannabis under the color of state law. And uh, certainly, my amendment would not prohibit the Department of Defense from disallowing cannabis for people who are actually in the military. But for people who seek to be in the military, it seems like an unnecessary gate that we continue to maintain. Uh, the committee has received evidence that the areas that are specifically impaired by this policy are AI, cyber, coding, at times Intel, because you know sometimes when people are in college or wherever, they use cannabis while goofing off. And maybe that shouldn't be a reason they shouldn't be able to express their patriotism through military service. Again, that cannabis amendment is 317. The final basket that I want to talk about is Ukraine. My amendment 1206 strips all the Ukraine money out of this bill, about 300 million. And what I think you've heard from people who feel strongly on the Ukraine issue is that these should be divided questions. I know that I'm in the major or the minority of the majority with my view on the Ukraine war. I'm in the minority when it comes to the overall House of Representatives. But this issue of whether or not the United States should continue to be involved in this war in Ukraine should not be commingled with these other critical questions about how we're going to operate the Department of Defense. It, it, whether you're for the war in Ukraine or you're against the war in Ukraine and the U.S. involvement, it at least is an issue that deserves its own dignity and its own vote. And the National Defense Authorization Act should not have to carry the Ukraine funding as an anchor. Uh, there's a second Ukraine amendment that I have that's a, a bit more targeted, Amendment Number 326, and this deals with end-use monitoring. Okay, so, so when we had the inspector general before us, and we asked questions in the committee, are we complying with end use monitoring when it comes to Ukraine? They could not answer the question yes. So the only thing that Amendment 326 requires 
is a certification by the Secretary of Defense that we are following our own laws when it comes to end use monitoring of this equipment. We know we haven't done it right the whole time. I think we should at least have to certify that we're following the law as we're sending weapons of war into, into a killing zone. And the final amendment I'll ask you to support is one uh, where I join my colleague, Ms. Jacobs, and the ranking member of the Rules Committee to stop the exportation of cluster bombs. Uh, uh, Mr. McGovern had a freestanding piece of legislation on this that I think correctly laid out what the international norms are regarding cluster bombs. And like, as I've heard our colleagues who support this decision defend cluster bombs, it seems to fall into two categories. One, well, Russia's using them and has them. Like, if just because Russia has something, we're going to give it to Ukraine, like, wh what are we going to send nu tactical nuclear weapons next? Since to my, the point that my colleague Mr. Davidson made, is the objective here to get Ukraine on some sort of military parity with Russia? If so, the cluster bombs would seem like a bizarre place to start anyway. And then the second argument made in favor of the cluster bombs is, well, they're only going to use them in their own country. How craven and depraved is that? We are still cleaning up cluster bombs now in Laos because of the high dud rate. These things go down, and you're going to have children with lost limbs and parents that they don't have anymore uh, because of this decision. And the fact that a country is willing to use it within their own boundaries in no way absolves us of the responsibility of sending them there when, when those folks die. So I hope you'll consider that as a bipartisan amendment as well, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Representative James, you're recognized for uh, any amendments you care to discuss. Hey, Roger, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Since 1992, Michigan has lost a total of two fighter squadrons, and we're on the verge of losing a third with the loss of our A-10 fighter mission. Michigan will be the only state in all the Air National Guard that will lose three fighter missions in 30 years with no replacements. My goal here today is to make the case for why Selfridge Air National Guard Base not only deserves a fighter mission, but why it's vital for all of us in our national security. By its history, I can confidently refer to Selfridge as the crown jewel of Southeast Michigan. It's a super base that houses the Coast Guard, Homeland Security, Marines, Army, uh, vehicle research, and many other assets. What's even more special is its invaluable contribution to our nation over its 106 years of history, just celebrated this July 8th. Along with recent NATO deployment for the Air Defender 23 and continued partnership with Latvia, Selfridge has time and time again proven an asset for our national security and defense. Aside from his current mission, Selfridge is positioned to defend Michigan, the Great Lakes, and beyond. Maintaining a fighter mission at Selfridge would not only fortify our assets along the northern border, yes, we have a critical northern border we must secure as well, but our critical infrastructure like the Sioux Locks. Defending our homeland is our number one priority and the number one priority of the 2022 National Defense Strategy. Our greatest and most likely future threats include China, Russia, and North Korea. These all originate from northern latitudes, while most of our fighter assets are being pushed to the coast, leaving our Midwest agriculture and defense base vulnerable. In a time of great power competition with the Chinese Communist Party and other adversaries, Congress has a duty to ensure that our armed forces are fully equipped to stand up to any threats abroad and especially at home. It is vital to ensure the Air National Guard is recapitalized and can provide for homeland defense with a fighter mission prior to the A-10s rolling off Selfridge Air National Guard Base. Since I've been sworn in, I've led and been a part of numerous initiatives to bring a future fighter mission to Selfridge. This includes a letter, a resolution, co-sponsoring my colleague Rep Bacon's fighter recapitalization bill, and meeting with military officials. One of those initiatives I undertook was to meet with Air Force officials and leadership, both civilian and uniform. In my meetings with Air Force Secretary Kendall and Chief of Staff General Brown, the number one conclusion that we reached is it's not just the superior fighter power that we have, the superior intellect that we have, and the superior platforms we possess, but the biggest gap that we have is our ability to project that combat power with our manufacturing base and our strength. We need a more vibrant and efficient defense industrial base with more fighters available 
without writing a blank check with zero accountability. For this reason, I filed an amendment with fellow Michigan representatives Lisa McLean, Jack Bergman, and John Molnar for the NDAA to authorize an increase in advanced procurement for more F-15 EX bomb fighter planes. For clarification, this money is not for new planes, but to increase capacity, something vital for our defense industrial base. This is for the next fiscal year to procure more planes than the consistent 24. During the appropriation season, I submitted a request for an increased procurement and advanced procurement of the F-15EX for the Defense Appropriations Bill, which also included direction to send the increase of planes to the Air National Guard with bases retiring um, A-10s. While the Appropriations Committee did not provide this increase, supporting the authorization provided to us by the Armed Services Committee would make the case to pair our numbers with appropriations increase the advanced procurement on the floor. Make no mistake, lack of capacity in, in our industrial base is a clear and present danger to the nation's ability to defend itself. Bringing the F-15EX mission to Selfridge and in increasing our capacity to project combat power by solidifying our industrial base, increasing capacity for these fighters is in our, uh, is in our vital national interest. This is also vital for Michigan National Guard's initiative to replace our A-10s, a legacy aircraft, since this plane is complementary to adjacent missions. I've had the pleasure of hearing from uh, Lieutenant General Lowe, the Director of Air National Guard, and how effective this fighter really is, and our willingness and ability to move forward to future missions. The House Armed Services Committee has graciously worked with me and our staff on advanced procurement to help procure six planes in fiscal year 25, the next fiscal year, and my amendment here uh, off offsets an extra $30 million for advanced procurement to help produce uh, up to eight total uh, F-15 EXs next year. The amendment also requires Air Force to ensure that these additional funds procured, again, would go to the Air National Guard bases that are losing their A-10 squadrons, which includes Selfridge Air National Guard Base, the 127th wing. In my district, Michigan's 10th Congressional District, Selfridge Air National Guard Base sits as the pride and joy of our community. At Selfridge, the 127th Fighter Wing uh, serves the state of Michigan with two vital flighting missions, the A-10 fighter and the KC-135 tanker. Residents of Harrison Township, Michigan, and surrounding areas often look to the skies with awe at the A-10 zooming by. It's a point of pride, but also a point of security, providing economic benefit for, for the area, for the region, for the state. And as I said, the base is uh, pride and joy for our community, but supporting this fighter mission has more. It has a purpose to secure not just the, uh, the southeast Michigan area, but the region and the nation. And I'm going to do everything I can to protect it. Recapitalizing Selfridge with the F-15EX aircraft will significantly enhance the protection of our airspace, not just in Michigan, but the nation, and securing our northern borders against those who would hurt us, protecting our vital infrastructure, and a third of North America's population within a 500-mile radius. More importantly, as representative of Michigan's 10th Congressional District, I cannot stand idly by while the A-10 and Selfridge are retired without a replacement fighter mission. I look forward to working with this committee, and I appreciate your consideration of including my amendment, Amendment 1074 to H.R. 2670, funding for advanced procurement for an F-15 EX aircraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Foster, you're recognized to address whatever amendments you care to. Well, uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Cole, Ranking Member McGovern. Yep. Audible here? Yep. Um, I'm, I'm, well, I just want to thank you all for allowing me to testify. As you may be aware, I represent 100 percent of the strategic reserve of PhD physicists in the United States Congress. And I'm here to request that the committee include two technical but important provisions in this year's NDAA. The first provision is to realign the National Technical Nuclear Forensics Program from the Department of Homeland Security, who has never really taken uh, ownership of this, and into the NNSA, the National Nuclear Security Administration, which has the desire and the technical expertise to oversee its critical mission. And secondly, um, my second provision I'll be speaking on is to authorize $20 million for research and development on low-enriched uranium, or LEU, fuel 
for pressurized water reactors for aircraft carriers and for submarines. Now, the, on the first provision, nuclear forensics is the scientific ability to uh, attribute the origin of nuclear material found outside of regulatory control or used in a nuclear device, and it's a central pillar of the U.S. strategy of nuclear deterrence. Uh, this is the team that is called in when, God forbid, a nuclear device is detonated on U.S. soil or anywhere on Earth, and they have to figure out where the nuclear device came from. And um, and the materials that went into it. Uh, so there, there can be no more important mission uh, to have on standby, hopefully never to be used. And, but it is essential to, hold, uh, to have this capability to hold any state, terrorist group, or non-state actor accountable for malicious or irresponsible uses of nuclear material. So in 2010, Congress formally established the NTNF program uh, to ensure a ready and robust nuclear forensics capability. However, the NTNF program's capabilities, as they've matured, uh, the misalignment of its functions with its parent agency has created inefficiencies that inhibit the program's <coughs> advancement. Uh, the, the, what the problem is, in a nutshell, is that the majority of our nuclear forensics analytic capabilities, including the technical expertise, the infrastructure, all reside within the DOE national laboratories. And while many agencies have a peripheral role in nuclear forensics, it is only NNSA within DOE that works across every aspect of nuclear forensics and understands the very uh, classified details of our weapons designs and the weapons designs of our, of our enemies. In contrast, the Department of Homeland Security has a very critical role, but it really has no operational role in NTNF's mission because the NTNF relies on things like nuclear device design and material production expertise that really is uh, NNSA's bailiwick. So realigning these programs to be under NNSA would increase the efficiency, eliminate duplication of efforts, and create a unified strategic direction for this program. And my second provision that I'm going to be speaking of is to authorize research and development on the use of low-enriched uranium for reactor fuel for naval propulsion reactors. Now, high-enriched uranium, or HEU, is arguably one of the world's most dangerous substances because it's a crucial component for nuclear weapons. Any country that has enough high enriched uranium to operate a reactor with it um, is more than 90% of the way towards having a significant stockpile of nuclear weapons. Uh, and this is why eliminating HEU for civilian purposes has been U.S. policy objective for 60 years. Uh, you know, scientists have spent their careers uh, trying to eliminate the, the use of high enriched uranium in places where it doesn't, uh, doesn't have to be used. Um, it's now acknowledged that we made a big mistake back in the 1950s and 60s when, as part of the Atoms for Peace program, we dispersed large amounts of high-enriched, weapons-grade uranium into research and propulsion reactors throughout the world. Um, but, and so in order to achieve the goal of, of pulling all this high-enriched uranium back in, we established international norms that, that high-enriched uranium should never be used for anything that does not require it. Um, and despite this, um, and we've made a tremendous, most of the research reactors around the world now no longer have had their HEU replaced by LEU. And we've done that in large part by setting a good example by not using high enriched uranium in, in areas where it's not necessary inside the United States. And despite our progress, there's one significant challenge remaining, that the, which is the use of high enriched uranium fuel for U.S. naval propulsion reactors. It's by far the largest remaining non-weapons use of HEU fuel um, in our country and actually on our planet. Uh, public estimates uh, assess the U.S. Navy uses over two tons of weapons-grade HEU, enough for 100 nuclear weapons every year, as will any other country who decides to follow in our footprints and make propulsion reactors for, uh, for submarines, for example. Um, and so this is a, this is a, a growing danger. You know, as you are probably all aware, the United States in the past has, has burned a lot of political capital, uh, stopping very advanced weapons programs in, in some of our allies. And those, those allies maintain, uh, maintain a posture of not being nuclear states because, uh, in large part, because they trust the United States and they are willing to, limit, to forego the use of, of high-enriched uranium, which makes them a, a nuclear threshold state. Um, and this has become increasingly important now with the AUKUS partnership uh, because the Australia is now going to be using U.S. naval propulsion reactors uh, of whatever kind we uh, teach them how to build. 
Um, they will be using these for submarines that are not supposed to be nuclear weapon submarines. They are conventional weapons on these the submarines. Um, but if they use high enriched uranium, that means Australia and any country that decides to you know, look at Australia and say, me too, is now going to be operating reactors with huge stockpiles of high enriched uranium and will be a more, more than threshold uh, weapon state. And for, this is the reason why we have worked for 60 years uh, to try to reduce this. Um, this is an old discussion with, um, with Congress. Uh, the Navy, there are, if you decide that the U.S. Navy wants to use uh, low enriched uranium instead of high enriched uranium, there are minor performance trade-offs that you have to make for, for submarines. There are no, Navy has acknowledged there are no real performance trade-offs in aircraft carriers, which are the big usage of this, or even in large diameter submarines. Um, but, but as more and more countries, you know, in, in the face of what's happened with Iran, in the face of what's happened with North Korea, more and more countries are realizing they want a standby nuclear capacity, and there is no easier way for them to, to get this. And just saying, well, we're going to do what the United States is helping Australia to do, which is to develop, um, to develop propulsion reactors using weapons-grade uranium. And so this is why it's a crucial thing that we, we continue R&D. Um, we know it's possible to build submarines that have low enriched uranium. The French do it. The Indians do it. The Russians do it. It's possible to do this, and the question is, how do you minimize the performance trade-off and enough to convince countries that this is a better route than you know, maintaining a large stockpile of weapons-grade uranium? So this is why I think this R&D program is critical. It's actually something that the, the Australians, if they join us in, will be doing something good for proliferation worldwide and something they can be proud of. Um, and so I really want us to lead by example and move toward a safer and more secure world. And uh, so as we consider the NDAA, I urge your strong consideration of amendments number 489 and 594. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Representative Rosendale, you're recognized to address whatever amendments you care to. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, propose Amendment Number 350. I appreciate you having me in today and for the uh, committee for listening to us. Uh, my Amendment 350 to the Fiscal Year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act would amend Section 1021B of the Fiscal Year 2012 NDAA to prohibit the U.S. military from indefinitely detaining U.S. citizens under the 2001 authorization of use of military force. Uh, Mr. Chair, I became aware of this in 2013, of this particular provision that gave the uh, United States military the ability to what I call snatch and grab, pick up United States citizens, take them off to foreign soils such as Guantanamo Bay without charges, without representation, and to detain them there for an unlimited amount of time um, without any representation whatsoever. This is a complete and total violation of every civil liberty that we have as American citizens and certainly as our God-given rights. President Obama signed the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012 on December 31st, 2011. The law gave the United States military the power to indefinitely detain Americans without charge or trial. Even more concerning is the provision allows for the detention until, and I quote, the end of hostilities, which could mean as long as the war on terror continues. When President Obama signed the NDAA into law, he felt the need to clarify through a signing statement that his administration would not authorize the indefinite detention of American citizens and work, would work with Congress to mitigate concerns. And as you all know, the signing of a statement is nothing more than a press release. It is not illegally binding and has no influence on the courts. This was a tacit acknowledgment that the provision could indeed result in the indefinite detention of American citizens. President Obama also claimed that he signed the law to keep funding for our troops. However, as legal scholar Jonathan Turley aptly pointed out at the time, and I quote, you do not support our troops by denying the principles for which they are fighting. They are not fighting to consolidate authoritarian powers in the president. The American way of life is defined by our Constitution and specifically the Bill of Rights. Senator Graham was at least honest when he said on the Senate floor referring to the provision, the statement of authority to detain does apply to American citizen and it designates the world as the battlefield, including the homeland. 
This should be troubling and disturbing to everybody in here. The U.S. military should not be able to detain American citizens on U.S. soil. This should solely be up to the FBI, local police, and state law enforcement officials. American citizens deserve and are guaranteed due process regardless of what their alleged crimes are. Due process and the rule of law has enabled our nation to exist for as long as it has. With every news story that breaks, the existence of a two-track justice system becomes more apparent. It is necessary now more than ever to reclaim these legal principles, which are the foundation of our justice, of our great nation. While this year's NDAA has many provisions I support and appreciate Chairman Rogers' diligent work, I cannot support legislation that would allow the United States military to act as police force on U.S. soil, apprehending Americans and whisking them off with no right to an attorney, no right to a trial, and no day in court. As members of Congress, we solemnly swear that we will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. My amendment would provide a needed fix to the fiscal year 2012 NDAA, and I urge support to protect the rights of our constituents. We have an opportunity now to make something right that has been in for 10 years, for 10 years. And I appreciate this committee considering this, and I hope that you will include it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Johnson, you're recognized to address whatever uh, amendments you care to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, too, want to echo what some of my uh, colleagues have said, uh, the daunting task that this committee has to undertake uh, on both sides of the aisle. Thank you, members that serve on the Rules Committee for keeping the work flowing uh, on the House floor, that uh, we couldn't do our job if you didn't do yours. So I, I, too, appreciate the work that you do. But I'm here today to speak in favor of my amendment, Amendment Number 186. This amendment, which has passed the House twice in bipartisan fashion, has a clear nexus to America's defense and national security. American liquefied natural gas exports not only increase jobs and investment here at home uh, and reduce carbon emissions significantly abroad, but exporting this resource is key to American security and securing and protecting our vital interests. Exporting LNG is quite literally exporting American geopolitical power. Look to Europe, for example. I have an article here, and I've, I've got it here if you want to see it, uh, entitled, How American Energy Helped Europe Best Putin. In it, the article outlines how Vladimir Putin sought to use energy as a weapon holding Europe hostage in a cold winter, and how he would have succeeded if not for the United States uh, natural gas. In one quote, the CEO of S&P Global in his analysis said, and I quote, U.S. LNG has become one of the foundations of U.S. and European energy security, part of the replacement for Russian gas, and has even become part of the arsenal of NATO. Let me reiterate that. He said LNG exports have become part of the arsenal of NATO. If that's not national security, I don't know what is. In addition to Europe, this also has significance in Asia and the Pacific. Asia is home to a number of growing energy-hungry economies, and increased U.S. LNG exports give us a key foothold in the region and serve as an additional check on, on an increasingly aggressive People's Republic of China. Uh, my dear colleagues, we need more of this uh, LNG exporting, and this is exactly what this amendment would do. And if we don't, the world is watching. Demand for energy isn't going down, and if America doesn't fill the void, do we want Qatar, Iran, or Russia projecting their energy resources? I don't think so. But we have a choice. America has abundant and accessible natural gas resources. We must use this to our advantage. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this amendment today, and I urge you to make this amendment in order. With that, I yield back. 
Thank you very much. The chair has no questions. I'll go to my good friend, the vice chair of the committee, uh, Dr. Burgess, for any questions you may have for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our uh, presenters who brought their very thoughtful amendments today. Uh, Mr. Davidson, Amendment Number 472 that you discussed <laughs> seems like hours ago, but uh, it's an it's a extremely important amendment. I had a lively discussion with the ranking member of the Armed Services Committee on just this very point. We've been asked to continually fund these activities, and the administration has not has not been forthcoming with the strategy. We don't know where we're going. We don't know how to know that we've gotten there when we get there. And it is really incumbent upon the administration to come to Congress and provide us the data that we need to be able to make those uh, those decisions. So I thank you for bringing that very thoughtful amendment. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Johnson, I think I've co-sponsored your amendment, exporting natural gas is exporting freedom. And uh, every time we do that, we replace uh, coal burning someplace else, and it actually helps the environment and so I think uh, your amendment is very timely as to be included in this. So thank you again, all of you, for, uh, for these very thoughtful amendments. And uh, as we consider them, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we'll go to my very good friend, distinguished ranking member of the full committee, Mr. McGovern, well, for any questions he may have. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you for coming and presenting your amendments. And, um, and uh, I'd like to say to people that you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something. Uh, and Mr. Gates, we actually agree on a couple of things. I, mean, I agree on your cannabis amendment, uh, but uh, I especially agree on your the the, the amendment uh, that you're supporting uh, with many of us on uh, on banning uh, on not using cluster munitions um, in Ukraine. Um, you know, cluster munitions are totally indiscriminate. They don't distinguish between a Russian soldier, a Ukrainian soldier, a woman, a child, or other civilians. Uh, they oftentimes, the unexploded ordinances remain for long periods of time. Um, mudslides, floods, every, move things around. Uh, and there's, there are real reasons why these weapons are banned in over 100 countries. And sadly, if we go forward with this, and again, I'm, I'm somebody who, unlike you, I actually support um, the uh, effort in Ukraine. I want to be as supportive as I can to help Ukrainians uh, repel the Russians. But if we, but sadly and badly, um, if the U, if we go through with this, the U.S. Uh, will have joined Russia and Syria as rogue nations that are that are using these banned weapons. And so, in any event, um, hopefully, uh, we the, the chair of the uh, Armed Services Committee and the ranking member both said that they thought that this amendment should be made in order. And so, hopefully, it will be, and we'll have a chance to debate it and vote on it. But thank you all. I yield back. Thank you very much. Now go to my very good friend, distinguished gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Westenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I just want to thank all my colleagues for coming in and your testimony. I appreciate it. For the sake of time, though, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Now I'll go to my other very good friend from Pennsylvania. The gentleman lady's recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. The public believes the gentleman. That doesn't happen often on this committee. <laughs> Uh, with that, I'll go to my good friend from Texas for any questions he may have for the panel. Thank you, Chairman, and, and I'll try to be brief, but I wasn't able to be here for the original um, you know, presentation of the bill. I want to thank my colleagues for coming here and testifying, and uh, I think you've each presented a number of things that are important for us to consider, uh, not us, the Rules Committee, but the body generally. Um, and just, I mean, a, a couple of points. I'd say, I'd say Mr. Gates um, from Florida, you've, you've presented, I think, a number of amendments. Um, and have a number of things that, that you're offering that you think that would improve uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. And I, there's a number of different categories of the things that I know that you have put forward, um, one of which that I think is critically important is on the area of improving uh, with respect to um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, CRT, et cetera, at the Department of Defense. Um, could you just expound just a little bit more on why that is so critically important for the purposes of recruiting at the Department of Defense, for cohesion, for morale, for having a strong national defense for purposes of standing up against China and other enemies and adversaries around the world. Yes, thank you. And I, I would acknowledge that in the underlying bill, we have wiped out critical race theory as a pedagogy tool in the Department of Defense, thanks to work by my colleague, Mr. Waltz, and uh, thanks to the work of my colleague, Mr. Banks, 
the diversity, equity, and inclusion positions at DOD won't be these $180,000 jobs. Uh, I think he's capped what they can make at around $50,000. So DEI doesn't become a career path unto itself, uh, totally untethered from the mission of the Department of Defense. Um, but, Mr. Roy, it was a majority-minority unit in my district uh, that pulled me aside when I was uh, visiting the installation and said, you know, this intense focus on our race has become problematic because the entire premise of the training we do is that everyone's part of the same team. We're going through these experiences together. We are growing together. And that it was particularly some of the uh, majority minority uh, units within the military who were harmed by this. I also think that it does hurt us on the recruiting front. You know, a lot of the geographic areas where we draw from to fill the billets at the Department of Defense uh, react negatively when told that by virtue of your skin color, you're either naturally oppressed or you're naturally an oppressor. Uh, oftentimes, the diversity, equity, and inclusion premise that the department advances is a direct critique of the values that the country learned through the civil rights movement, that we should be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. And, and I think, uh, Mr. Roy, you, you might not have been, I won't make everyone suffer through it again, but I, I did point out that on the promotion packets, Secretary Austin first demanded that the photos be taken off, and then when that had the direct opposite result that he'd hoped, he, re he required a reversal of that. So, so that we are not, you know, on the teeter-totter of DEI, we simply ought to ban its adoption and practice in the military. So you, you're offering an amendment that would prohibit federal funds for training on diversity, equity, and inclusion, correct? Yeah, that's correct. That is amendment number 314. Um, and, and so the bottom line here is there were improvements made in the NDAA, but they didn't go far enough, right? I mean, that, that would be the, the ultimate point about what we have with respect to continuing to divvy us up by race, to, to use the language that Chief Justice Roberts used in previous uh, rulings, and obviously something that we just saw unfold with respect to affirmative action and the rulings by the court. What we're trying to do is move to a colorblind, race-neutral worldview, where we're focused on building a national defense and a military that is focused on, you know, blowing things up and killing people, not on social engineering wrapped in a uniform. And so I would, I would certainly encourage my colleagues for accepting uh, those amendments and where you want to go. My, my friend from Montana, Mr. Rosendale, I wonder if you might comment just a little bit more on um, the importance of, of the amendment that you're offering with respect to uh, transgender surgeries. Uh, I, was, I was not able to hear the specific testimony. So I did not actually uh, oh, didn't offer that speak one. to I, I, I'm offering, but I didn't speak to it. I, okay, I sorry. Mr. Gates had. Mr. Action. Gates, you can offer that then, sorry. Yeah, yeah that, uh, that is an amendment I offered uh, because so much of the cost goes into psych. And I, I worry when the military engages in a, in a purported medical practice where like 75, 80% of the overall cost is in the, the psych side, that might not necessarily in order to better capabilities in the military. So if people want to get gender reassignment surgeries, I would suggest that those ought to be on their own time and on their own dime. Uh, thank you. Does Mr. Gentleman from Montana have anything to add to that? I think that summarizes it very well. Thank you. Um, l let me ask a question. Um, you know, we see you know, the United States Marine Corps putting out, you know, these kinds of, of uh, social media and advertisements. Do you think that makes our military more likely to defeat our enemy? Uh, Mr. Rosendale, can you see this, uh, a rainbow bullets on a, on a helmet? Anything that detracts from um, the mission, which is to protect our nation and make us the most effective fighting force on earth, is a distraction and a waste of money. Uh, I would ask Mr. Davidson, I know you served in, in the armed forces, um, and Mr. James, I believe you did as well. I mean, do you see uh, members, for example, here in the United States Air Force saluting the, you know, pride flag in social media. Is that, I think, beneficial to the cohesion of our United States military? Do you think that makes our military more effective and more likely to defeat our enemies? Yeah, I actually have a, uh, an amendment, the, the old glory uh, uh, amendment that would require that the only flag flown on our installations is the United States flag. Uh, we don't need to be flying the pride flag. It's meant to divide. It's not meant to heal and unite. And frankly, it, it co-ops, uh, you know, God's symbol of the rainbow uh, to promote an agenda hostile to that uh, doctrine. So I don't think it brings people together. I think it divides people. And uh, the administration obviously disagrees. 
uh, and it puts our troops in a big challenge. They want to focus on the mission, and I think uh, Mr. Gates summed it up well. They're, they want to be on the same team working to accomplish the same mission, and ultimately when that happens, uh, you, you know, cohesion and unit, uh, unity, uh, you know, come together the, the right way. When it's all like PowerPoint slides or, you know, ribbons on your uniform or things like that, flags, uh, it, it tends to divide people, and it certainly... Uh, in my own district has deterred people who have approached me to say, I don't think I can join, uh, I don't think I can enlist. Uh, I had a young lady turn down an appointment to the Air Force Academy, partially over the COVID vaccine mandate, but also over kind of, you know, what, what has come to be termed as woke ideology kind of broadly. And it, it's a loss of focus. She still wants to be uh, an Air Force uh, officer at some point, but she doesn't want to be under a military academy. And I think we're losing talent over this, so I think it's right to focus on it. And you lose talent, you hurt readiness. Well, I appreciate that. And since the gentleman referred to academies, I would note, um, you know, the Air Force Academy uh, had a uh, presentation, a document that that uh, was presented under my office that I think I've seen publicly um, that goes through a number of different things about saying that, for example, we should refer to parents, caregivers, or guardians instead of mom and dad. Um, you know, that we should say partner instead of boyfriend, girlfriend, that you, you've got questions here about, you know, the Air Force Academy instructing cadets to not use phrases like, quote, we're all just people. Do you agree? I, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to ask the question. Gonna, yeah, I will. Yeah, I'll yield. I'm, if, if the gentleman in the guild. So that very presentation I showed to General Brown. And I asked him about it, and he said that, th that this type of approach was necessary so that we could better understand the airmen next to us. And I asked General Brown if he had ever met a person who was in the military who was offended by the term mom and dad, and he said that he couldn't. So it was an example of sort of a, a, an, an academic reflex changing the way we think about parenting uh, in a way that didn't actually help anyone, but that makes our military look ridiculous. So what, what you're pointing out is not something that the committee has not thoroughly examined, and I think it should, should concern you and it should concern all of us that... The military didn't, uh, wasn't sheepish about that. They doubled down. Uh, a couple, one more set of questions, and I'll be mindful of the committee's time. Um, Mr. Gage, I know you presented a number of amendments, and I, I believe in this context, have we, uh, the Ukraine amendments, are they the ones you presented here? Um, I, I noticed that the, uh, the ranking member here on this committee talked about um, cluster bombs, and I... I wanted to see if you shared my concern, I think you do, that, you know, for the benefit that such uh, weapons may provide for the United States in the event that we needed to use them for some purpose, putting aside whether they should be banned or not, the fact of saying that we are going to distribute these um, even to our current allies who may not in the future be our allies strikes me as unwise. And I'm just wondering if the gentleman might be able to expound on that. I share that view. Our colleague, Mr. Mills of, of Florida, recently shared that view. And if, if we are ever in a position where we are relying on cluster munitions to protect the homeland, something has gone terribly wrong. And a lot of the other stuff that we've attempted has not worked. So I don't, uh, uh, the amendment that Ms. Jacobs has sponsored that Mr. McGovern and I have joined her in, in co-authoring does not prohibit the United States from building cluster munitions, from maintaining cluster munitions, it bans the export of those munitions. Right now, there's only one scenario dangerously being contemplated for the export of these munitions, and it was the decision by President Biden to send them to Ukraine, which is foolish. Um, on that point with respect to Ukraine, because uh, some statements have been made, I just want to kind of um, expand on just one second, which is, uh, do you share my view that, you know, you wish the, the, uh, and, and support the people of Ukraine in standing up against Putin in, in their own regard. Um, but that the question of turning over the decision-making as to, uh, you know, uh, what should be accomplished in Ukraine to whatever uh, Mr. Zelensky suggests, or that whatever Mr. Zelensky defines with respect to, for example, Crimea or uh, other uh, decisions he might make for their national security interests, isn't there a hard line and a break and a difference between their national security interests and our national security interests? Well, of course. I share Mr. Davidson's view that we should at least get a vision or a strategy from the administration, and I hope that we do not accept as a premise that the future of the United States is inexorably linked to the future of Ukraine. 
I've heard that argument made by a number of our congressional colleagues in floor debate that so goes Ukraine, so goes the United States of America. I would hope we wouldn't have such a low view of ourselves that we would tie ourselves to the country that's the third most corrupt country in the world and the most corrupt country in Europe, according to Goldman Sachs. Uh, I have a higher view of America than that. But whether you support the U.S. continued involvement in this war or not, I think there are a number of amendments that can be made in order, like Mr. Davidson's amendment, like my amendment on end use monitoring, so that we're not just sending stuff into Ukraine and then seeing it potentially for sale back to the cartels on, on Texas's border. Uh, and so end use monitoring, re requiring a strategy, I think those are good incremental steps. I would note that the underlying bill does greatly strengthen the inspector general uh, capabilities, and it looks more like CIGAR than it does the normal IG process. CIGAR didn't save us from being entirely grifted in Afghanistan, but at least after the fact, we're able to determine that we were by huge amounts. So that's why that amendment is important. But my, my sincere hope for the Rules Committee, Mr. Roy, is that you give the Ukraine vote its own dignity. Whether people are there to continue this $300 million in funding that's in the bill or not, that should be a separate question. The NDAA should not have to carry Ukraine. Ukraine should be its own question. I yield back. Mr. Johnson, quick question, and then I'll let Mr. Davidson I'll go to you. Mr. Johnson, uh, you posited, uh, and I think correctly, liquefied natural gas and the export thereof is critical to our national security. I would share that sentiment. Um, some are suggesting that our line that we should draw here with respect to amendments. So, Mr. James, Mr. James. Representative James, but, Representative James. Uh, John. You're not excused. You can't get up as a witness and leave during a panel. Sorry, It's all right. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wrap this up for you, Mr. James, here pretty quickly. Mr. Johnson, uh, some have suggested that a, a line that we need to draw with respect to what is able to be considered is that it be an amendment or be language that was referred to the HASC, the Armed Services Committee. Um, and I'm not 100% sure if your LNG amendments or similar amendments were in fact referred to HASC, but I would just ask you, do you nevertheless believe that they are central to our national security and meritorious of debate in this context? They, they are central to our national security. Uh, you've heard it said many times in our conference, energy security is national security. It's one and the same. Without energy security, we don't have national security. That applies to uh, pulling back Putin's power and his use of energy as a weapon in Europe. We have talked to the uh, parliamentarian, and everything we've been told is that this is germane to the NDAA. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Davidson, you uh, lifted your finger up. You wanted to, I think, comment. Well, the specific to the one of the amendments I offered it requires a mission from Ukraine, uh, a mission for Ukraine uh, in exchange for the $300 million that's in the base text. And as I spoke with Chairman McCall about it, he said, well, why not just require the mission? Why withhold the funding? And, you know, if, if as Mr. Gates is proposing, the funding were a separate amendment from the base text, I mean, it would probably pass. Uh, I would vote no on it. Uh, but if, if the amendment that I'm offering were neutered and just says you should give us a mission, uh, I guess it'd be better than the strongly worded letters that I've sent unanswered, uh, and it at least it require in statute that they provide a mission, uh, and then separately there could be a vote on whether we should fund Ukraine. I have a hard time understanding how anyone's voted for a dime. I've voted no for all of them. I, I recognize I'm in a maybe one or two other people here in the room uh, that have voting cards that are in that position, but. I don't know how you could allocate any resources without knowing what the mission is, uh, because the resource set for a regime change in Russia, including war crimes tribunals for Vladimir Putin, is entirely different than the level of resources to make sure that uh, the war doesn't spread to NATO member country. And even when you say that no Russians in Ukraine, that mission's different whether you include Crimea or not Crimea. And we're just funding it blindly. Uh, I, I don't understand how we've sent them a dollar, let alone uh, another 300 million or 300 billion in this. So um, I, I think it's important that the language is there, but I suggest as a strategy that it could be decoupled from the base text uh, as, a, as a way to kind of answer the indi individual questions, as uh, Mr. Gates pointed out. And I yield. 
Mr. Davidson, I, I would say I'm, I've got some amendments that I'm not going to be able to speak to, but I'll mention them right here that I have an amendment that expresses the sense of Congress that Article 5 of the uh, North Atlantic Treaty does not supersede the constitutional requirement under, the Consti under uh, Article 2 that the Congress declare war uh, or authorize the use of military force prior to the United States engaging in hostilities. I hope that we'll accept that as something that states the true statement that we must defer to the Constitution and not allow uh, an Article 5 trigger to supersede our responsibility and requirement here to declare war and make uh, our choices as the United States. And secondly, that uh, expressing the sense of Congress that the United States should not continue subsidizing NATO member countries who choose not to invest in their own defense by meeting the 2014 Wales Summit defense spending benchmark, among other things. Uh, I know we'll have further conversation, debate about that. One last question, I promise, Chairman's last question. Mr. Davidson, I know you've expressed concerns about um, privacy and the security of the American people, uh, particularly with information, uh, some of which I think is connected to the Department of Energy, and some are suggesting that as such, it's not uh, something that should be considered as part of the NDAA debate. Can you just make clear as to why that is not true? and that that is why it is central to our conversation about defending the United States, that we make sure that the American people's information is being secure, regardless of whether that touches a different department. I think your mic needs to be on. Yeah, I, I think that it's very clear the Department of Defense has used appropriated dollars to purchase data from data brokers, that if they wanted the same data set, uh, they would have to get a warrant for they wouldn't have a justification for the warrant. Normally, the warrant wouldn't be granted because it would be bulk. It wouldn't specify time, manner, and place of any search or anything else. Uh, so they wouldn't be permitted to do it. So they're circumventing our Fourth Amendment. And I will say that every single member uh, of the officer corps has sworn an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. They are willfully circumventing the Fourth Amendment. And how do you not stop Department of Defense uh, from doing that? I mean, it's clearly germane, uh, but the idea that Judiciary Committee would also need a referral, the Chairman of Judiciary supports the amendment, uh, but, oh, but you didn't check with Hask. You didn't ask us nicely. Look, uh, it's 100% germane, and the people are sick of these cute sort of ways to weasel out of casting recorded votes. Uh, we have a coalition that should guarantee this amendment passes. Uh, it is important to hold the Department of Defense accountable to do what they've sworn to do, which is defend our Constitution and our way of life. And, of course, we think of them on physical security, but the principles they're defending uh, are distinctive to our country, and privacy is guaranteed by our Fourth Amendment. I think, the gentlemen, uh, I would just point out that central to all of this, and the reason these amendments matter, is that the defense of the United States right now is weaker than it should be because we have politicized the Department of Defense. Uh, we've turned it into a social engineering experiment. We are no longer focused on the key mission of defending the United States and ensuring that they are trained to carry out the task. We're undermining the morale, undermining recruiting, and that needs to change, and it needs to change immediately. It cannot be something where the you know latest climate fetish or you know transgender debate or uh, you know social engineering question is being foisted upon the men and women who sign up to serve in the United States military. Um, I appreciate my colleagues for presenting these things. I hope I'll have further debate about it. I yield back to the chairman. Thank you very much. Are there any additional questions for this panel? Seeing none, you are mercifully excused. And thank you for your patience. Appreciate you testifying. With that, uh, Mr. Roy, are you stepping out? No, no I, I just I thought you might have an amendment you wanted to present before, or we can do it later. If you... We'll do it later if we can. All right, that's fine. Thank you very much. I'd invite our next panel to come up, and that would include Mr. Clyde, uh, Ms. Cheryl, Mr. Green, Mr. Stauber, Mr. E, uh, Elsey, and Mr. or Ms. Crockett, excuse me. Welcome. If we can, what we'll do is just start with Mr. Clyde, and we'll just move right down the line. So from the left to the right, uh, 
Mr. Clyde, you're recognized for any amendments you care to speak to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, and thank you very much uh, to all the members um, of the Rules Committee. I know you all put in tremendous hours uh, way before we start voting, and, and uh, I just appreciate that very much. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, I urge my colleagues to support my common sense amendment to block unnecessary uh, efforts to rename civil works projects across the country, specifically my First Amendment, number 1438, uh, to prevent funds from being spent on Section 370 of the FY21 NDAA. Additionally, my Second Amendment, number 1459, prohibits Section 370 of the Fiscal Year 21 NDAA from impacting civil works projects. Um, this, is, this issue is very near and dear to me and to my constituents in North Georgia's 9th District. As the Army Corps of Engineers initiated and then temporarily paused a baseless move to rename Buford Dam and Lake Sydney Lanier. While it began as a multi-purpose Army Corps project for water supply and flood control, Lake Lanier has become one of the most popular recreational destinations in the state of Georgia and the most popular Army Corps project in the entire United States boasting more than 12 million visitors in 2022 alone. However, the Army Corps exceeded the directive of Congress, having never been authorized to engage in renaming projects like these in my district, which are co-owned and co-controlled by another entity, the state of Georgia, as is the case with both Buford Dam and Lake Lanier. Now, let me give you some context here. Um, first, we have a letter from the Naming Commission to the uh, Armed Services um, ranking member uh, in January 6, 2022, now the Armed Services uh, Chairman, uh, Mike Rogers, where it says, um, uh, for these civil works assets, we have noted that these assets in large measure are managed by the associated states. As such, the commission does not intend to bring the identified civil works assets into the renaming process and our decision to exclude them from the renaming process in our final report to Congress. Well, let's go to the final report to Congress. In the final report to Congress on page 22, uh, section 3, it says the commission believes these assets are not within its purview to provide a naming recommendation. And then we go to um, <clears throat> a letter that was sent to me by the Army Corps dated March the 9th of 2023, uh, where the Army Corps says that um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, Mobile District will develop and submit a new name for Lake Lanier and Buford Dam for consideration by the Department of the Army. And then on the next day, on March the 10th, they submit a press release uh, basically saying exactly the same thing that they plan on renaming these. Um, I made a uh, couple of phone calls to them and reminded them of the, um, of, this, uh, of the report of Congress. They sent back an email three days later that says, we have been advised by our headquarters to pause any further action concerning these renamings. However, they're still accepting potential new names. So in reality, they're not really pausing it at all, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, and Mr. Chair, I would like to submit these letters and this documentation for the record. That objection is ordered. Thank you very much. Um, furthermore, and very importantly, the renaming of civil works projects will have a devastating economic impact on our communities. For example, if the Corps is successful in renaming Lake Lanier and the Buford Dam, not only would taxpayers have to foot the bill for replacing hundreds of road signs and road markers, but also countless small businesses and organizations in the surrounding area named after the lake would also be forced to rename, incurring significant costs including new registration fees, additional marketing expenses, and even complete rebranding of their businesses. Businesses in the tourism industry would be forced to replace entire inventories, and many simply would not survive the financial burden of doing so. And just to give you some examples, we have Lake Lanier Islands, we have Lake Lanier Parkway, Lake Lanier Resort, Lake Lanier Association, Lake Lanier Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Boys and Girls Club of Lanier, just to give you a few examples. <clears throat> and then I have a letter here that um, came from the chief operating officer of a longtime local business who said, and I quote, Lake Lanier has been a cultural, lifestyle, and economic driver for North Georgia since its creation in the 1950s. Its name has been synonymous with leisure on the water, and so many businesses and attractions have associated their names and economic entities with Lake Lanier. 
To make such a drastic change will have an extremely negative effect on the entire region. In fact, there's even a constituent who named their daughter because they spent so much time on Lake Lanier, they named their daughter Lanier. <clears throat> now, I have, a, I have a, a pamphlet here, Lake Lanier, Lake Lanier pamphlet. And in it, it says 12 million visitors last year and a $912 million economic impact in Hall County, Georgia. That's almost a billion dollars that Lake Lanier's impact is on my district. So <clears throat> changing the name, I believe, would have catastrophic impact, and it is simply unacceptable that our federal government would place this burden on the very communities we claim to support. While I'm glad the Corps has temporarily halted, at least in part, uh, this action in Georgia, I have heard from colleagues in other communities across our country that are facing the same economic threats. Furthermore, with our national debt exceeding $32 trillion, Congress must rein in all unnecessary and irresponsible spending. Just the renaming of Lanier would cost over a million dollars, according to the Army Corps. For these reasons, I'm submitting my amendment, number 1459, to ensure the termination of the authorization of Section 370 of the FY21 NDAA regarding these civil works renaming projects. And I urge my colleagues to support my common sense amendment and to make it in order. Um, <clears throat> then secondly, I have another amendment that I would like to, um, oh, also to add to this, um, here is a letter from uh, the House of Representatives from the state of Georgia, and I request unanimous consent for this to be entered into the record as well. Subject and so ordered. Where all of the representatives around Lake Lanier uh, eight signatures on this letter are calling for a complete cessation of any activity that would rob Georgia citizens of our valued name because Lake Lanier and the city of Beaufort have an excellent history over the past several decades. <clears throat> so thank you for that. My next amendment is amendment number 1448. Uh, I testify today in support of it. This crucial amendment allows citizens with state issued concealed carry permits or licenses to conceal, a, to conceal carry a handgun across all state or territory lines, as long as the permit holder follows the laws of that state, territory, or district. The Second Amendment rights of Americans do not disappear when crossing state lines. Law-abiding citizens should not face a felony charge because of inconsistencies across state lines for a constitutional right. Just as our right of free speech doesn't change whether I'm in Georgia or New York, neither should our Second Amendment liberties. My amendment will protect law-abiding citizens' right to conceal carry and allow them to travel freely between states without worrying about conflicting state laws. For far too long, this inconsistency has impacted American citizens. It has especially impacted service members and veterans as well as their families as they move across state lines or are visiting other states for official purposes. In 2022, a Marine veteran, Lloyd Muldraw, leaped into action to rescue a friend who was pistol whipped in a club when visiting Baltimore. When the police arrived on the scene, Muldraw was arrested for carrying a concealed weapon, which he did not pull or use during the incident, despite having a carry, concealed carry permit in Virginia. I think that's a disgrace. Our service members and veterans who are some of the highest trained individuals in this nation with firearms should not be punished for carrying a concealed weapon which they have a lawful permit for over state lines in their home state. We cannot allow what happened to Marine veteran Muldrow to happen to any other service member or veteran, and I urge my colleagues to support this important amendment to protect American Second Amendment liberties, especially for our heroes that have served our nation to protect all of our precious liberties, and I ask that it be made in order. <clears throat> I offer my amendment number 1303, um, to, the ND, to the 2024 NDAA that would allow our brave service members who were forcibly discharged due to their courageous stand against the Biden administration's now repealed unconstitutional vaccine mandate to be reinstated to the U.S. military and expunge all adverse marks on their service records for their vaccination status. In 2021, the Biden administration's Department of Defense unconstitutionally mandated the COVID-19 vaccine for all service members of the U.S. military jeopardizing our national security and our armed forces mission, readiness by expelling highly trained and experienced personnel out of the military for a personal medical decision, 
And I, had a, I have a base in my district where the executive officer was expelled because of his deeply held religious beliefs. He was literally the number one Army Ranger of his rank. And it was a disgrace that he was expelled for this. Despite the proven ineffectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine and even President Biden's assertion last September that the pandemic is over, the Department of Defense and President Biden continuously defended the medical tyranny of their harmful mandate up until its repeal. <clears throat> Thankfully, congressional Republicans successfully fought to remove the military's COVID-19 vaccine mandate from last year's NDAA. Once again, it's up to congressional Republicans to ensure that service members who were unfairly subjected to President Biden's authoritarian vaccine mandate are treated with fairness and receive the due process that they deserve. I applaud the efforts of the House Committee on Armed Services to ensure these service members are treated in an impartial fashion. However, I want to make it unequivocally certain in this bill that service members that were discharged for their vaccination status have the option to return to the military with no repercussions in any way, shape, or form. Therefore, I urge adoption of my amendment number 1303 for the fiscal year 2024 NDAA that would ensure all service members who are given an administrative discharge <clears throat> or a general discharge because of their uh, COVID-19 vaccination status shall have that discharge expunged and changed to an honorable discharge. Or if they have already been reinstated, that all mention of any retribution faced for failure to comply with the vaccine mandate be expunged from their military service record immediately. I believe that it is unfair that a certain subset of our service members and veterans, as the law currently stands, will be forever marked with a general discharge status on their service records simply because they served in the military under the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. We must ensure that no service member, whether they served two years, a year ago, or currently serve now, have this ridiculous discharge status on their record because of their rightful refusal to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. It is up to us to undo President Biden's unlawful and actions taken against our brave service members in doing so we will also bolster our national security and ensure that our military remains the most lethal fighting force in the world by reinstating highly trained and experienced soldiers that were unlawfully removed from our military due to their vaccination status. Once again, I urge um, adoption of my amendment. And finally, <clears throat> uh, I rise today in support of Amendment Number 668 to the FY24 NDAA. My amendment solves an excessive regulation issue created by an ATF reinterpretation that happened about a decade ago. Currently, the ATF classifies cartridges with a caliber, gauge, or millimeter above 50 caliber, that's a half inch, as an explosive, even when no explosive exists. It has caused, <clears throat> and, and only a propellant exists. It has caused federal firearms licensees, including manufacturers, importers, and dealers, as well as our very own military, to pay higher shipping costs and higher regulatory costs. Because when ATF classifies ammunition as explosive, then the Department of Transportation must regulate it as such, and those higher costs are incurred in transportation and in regulation and in regulating product and testing. For ammunition classified as explosive, there are new and more restrictive licensing and storage magazine requirements in addition to more costly transportation requirements. You know, if something is truly explosive, then we should treat it as such. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's the right way to do it. I'm sure we can all agree on that. But if something has no explosive in it, then it should not be regulated as if it did. As someone with over 30 years of experience in the firearms industry and as a Navy combat veteran, I find this overregulation completely illogical. It doesn't make sense to the firearms industry, and it certainly doesn't make sense to the defense industry. To address this, my amendment expands the ammunition exemption to include cartridges with inert projectiles, regardless of the caliber or millimeter. An inert projectile means no explosive in the projectile, simply training rounds. That's it. If my amendment is adopted and passed, the entire firearms industry and the military combined will potentially save millions of dollars in lower shipping costs. Additionally, the industry will save significant amounts of money in lower regulatory costs, which could translate into lower prices for military contracts as well. One glaring example is the M781 uh, 40 millimeter ammunition, and I have some examples if you would like to see them after this. But uh, I ask that uh, my amendment be considered in order, and I'm happy to answer any questions, as I believe it will save our military and our industries potentially millions of dollars in shipping costs. Thank you, and I yield back. Thanks, gentlemen, for uh, this thorough and engaging discussion. 
You, you, did you want to submit one of those 40 millimeters for the, for the record? I would be happy to, if you would like one. <laughs> no, I don't think it'll be necessary. Okay, thank you. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Green from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the members of the Rules Committee for allowing us this opportunity. I also thank the uh, many persons who work with you, the staff. Uh, I want you to know, Mr. Chairman, that they do an outstanding job, and I greatly appreciate the way they have helped us to negotiate the system. Mr. Chairman, I have several amendments, and because I am told that brevity is not a liability, uh, I shall be as pithy and concise as possible. Uh, the first amendment is the real property preemption amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment would deal with the some 30 or more states that are currently crafting laws that will prohibit persons from purchasing property based upon citizenship. While this might seem innocuous, Mr. Chairman, uh, some of these laws could create international conflicts. Uh, we do not believe that states should be in the business of determining whether or not persons can purchase property based upon citizenship. Uh, my hope is, my prayer is, that we can preempt this activity such that states cannot perform this function and allow this to be in the hands of the Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States. There may be a need to give the committee some additional authority to do this, but I believe that it would be far better to preempt than to allow some 30 states to have this patchwork, if you will, of laws that preempt persons from purchasing property based upon citizenship. Finally, on this point, I do believe that there are times when we want to prohibit persons from purchasing property in certain places near our military facilities. Uh, obviously, that could be of concern. And there are other facilities as well. I just don't believe that we ought to have 30 states, perhaps as many as 50 in the final analysis, to engage in this type of conduct. The next piece of legislation will be the renal medullary carcinoma legislation, Mr. Chairman, something that you have a great deal of knowledge about. Uh, the Byron Nash Renal Medullary, Medullary Carcinoma Bill is one that sort of touches my heart. I knew the young man, African American. I mentioned his ethnicity, his race, only because this disease is deadly. And it seems to strike persons who are of African ancestry who have the sickle cell trait. Uh, this young man when it was discovered that he had this dreadful, deadly disease, it was too late to save his life. And the disease is very difficult to recognize. Even the best physicians can miss this disease and not properly diagnose. It's my opinion that we can spend a very small amount of money to accord states uh, such that they will match and will give doctors the additional information that they need to diagnose properly this disease and save lives. Again, it's a little bit personal. I knew the young man. Uh, he had a, a decent future ahead of him, but it was snatched away from him because of renal medullary carcinoma. The next piece of legislation is the residential loan question for veterans. <clears throat> I'm not a veteran. And in a sense, I, I sense that I, I have a debt that I owe. Uh, people who are willing to go to distant places, put their lives on the line, many of them don't return. And many of those that do return don't return the way they left. I was in a distant place a while ago, Mr. Chairman, and I looked over my right shoulder. I was literally lost. And I saw a sign that said, come in and see the price of freedom. It dealt with veterans. It was a VA hospital. 
You want to see the cost of freedom, the price of freedom, go to a VA hospital. I have great respect for veterans. This is a very simple and a very beneficial piece of legislation that would require on the residential loan application a placement of the fact that a person is a veteran above the signature line such that a veteran before signing would be aware of the fact that you can check this and in so doing uh, make yourself available to opportunities that you might miss simply because it is not known that you are a veteran applying for this loan. Uh, this would help the many people who are willing to put their lives on the line for us to simply move this question above the signature line so that a veteran would see it, would check it, and could receive, receive the benefits afforded veterans simply because of what they do and who they are. The next piece of legislation is the Merchant Mariners legislation. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Merchant Mariners have not been treated fairly by our country. Merchant Mariners were involved in World War II. They were persons who provided the goods, transported them across the ocean to our personnel. They transported personnel. Many of them died on a per capita basis. No branch of the military exceeds, exceeded the death of the merchant mariners. The merchant mariners were not accorded the privileges that our other service members were accorded until 1987. 1987 for World War II. And the GI Bill, which afforded persons the opportunity to get a college education or go to a vocational school, they, um, they didn't get the benefit of that. Uh, they didn't get the benefit of loans for homes. These are people who put their lives on the line. Thousands of them died. Approximately a quarter of a million served. Mr. Chairman, we really should honor them by according them a one-time payment of $25,000 to do what we intended to do but could not do because of our not being timely in according them the benefits that others received. Most of these persons now are in their 90s. They're in the twilight of life. They have paid their dues. And they've come to Washington, D.C. to petition the country that they serve, requesting that they be given this small amount of money compared to the many amounts of money that we spend I don't mean to say to anybody that $25,000 is uh, something that should be considered <coughs> trivial. But I do say that we should afford them this amount of money because of the services that they rendered and the fact that they were risking their lives and because we intended to help them. It's just that we passed the legislation or the opportunity to help them did not itself until 1987. Moving on to the um, military recruitment study. Uh, I've heard many persons talk about the military and how persons are treated and should be treated, should not be treated. This is really not about that. This is about ascertaining who's serving, to what extent, and whether or not one segment of our society may be shouldering a disproportionate share of the burden of service. I think it's good to know these things. If you know these things, you can make the adjustments necessary to, to, to assure us that service, which is something that's necessary, 
wouldn't want to have a country without a military, to be quite candid with you, not in the world that I live in. But uh, to assure us that uh, the, the burden of service is being borne um, fairly by all within the country. The next uh, piece of legislation is the Homes for Heroes legislation. Um, I think that when we who have the preeminent privilege of making decisions about housing for veterans, I think that when we make these decisions, having this great privilege and opportunity, we should consider the condition of veterans. We should consider those folk who sleep under bridges, those people who live in the streets of life, who've made great sacrifice so that we can have liberty and justice for all. It ought to tear at your heart to see a veteran standing on a corner under a bridge pleading for help, homeless. This is the richest country in the world. This is something that we should not tolerate. And I believe that when our various housing agencies are making these decisions about housing, that the condition of our veterans should be considered. Uh, they, they should be given opportunities to, um, to move from the streets of life to a place that they can call home. And we should do more to, to get that done. I know that we've done a lot. I don't deny that we have uh, done much. But there is much more to be done. And if we would simply require that these agencies that deal with housing, that they give consideration to the condition of our veterans when they're making their decisions, I believe that much more can be done. Finally, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Disaster Management Office, Disaster Recovery Bill, CDBGDR. Um, we know that we will have disasters. It's just a matter of time. It will happen. I think it appropriate, and I believe so to the extent that I've sponsored legislation that quite frankly passed the House once but did not pass the Senate. Legislation that would help us to somewhat streamline this process, but more importantly, legislation that would uh, allow us to fund an entity uh, within the government that would have this responsibility of dealing with these disaster release funds. It's a complicated concern, complicated problem, complicated issue, complicated because currently we are in the business of reinventing the wheel uh, for each disaster. Uh, that can work well if you have the institutional knowledge available to you to continue the process in an efficacious fashion. The unfortunate circumstance is that we lose institutional knowledge. Be great if we could codify these, uh, these, these necessities, and to have an agency, an entity within the government that would manage uh, these, uh, these monies so that we can make sure that everybody who is in need will have some portion of that need satiated. Mr. Chairman, I was as brief as I could be given the <laughs> the circumstance that I had to deal with. <laughs> but I thank you for your smile, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I will yield to my capable, competent, and qualified colleagues on the panel. Gentleman yields back. Chair's uh, pleased to recognize a gentlelady from New Jersey. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll have to bring my colleague up north and we can teach you how to talk fast up in Jersey. <laughs> but I appreciate your comments, and I certainly appreciate all of the work of this committee, uh, as well as I, I'd like to echo um, what you said about all the professional staff members um, and how hard you all work. Thank you so much. I come before the committee today to speak up for our service women and military families whose rights and access to basic health care have come under attack since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. With over 100,000 active duty service members serving in Texas alone, 
a state where basic rights have become so bad that women such as Anna Zargarian and Lauren Miller have brought lawsuits because their access to basic reproductive health care was so poor it endangered their lives and they had to flee to other states to get cared for. We can only imagine how many military families would be put at greater risk if this body institutes a travel ban and no longer allows women the leave and travel they need to seek care outside of states that endanger their reproductive health with draconian abortion laws. In the court cases that continue to be brought by Texas women, we see that the majority seek care in other states. Many of our service women are serving far from home and have neither the support networks nor the finances to seek that care on their own. Providing them time off work and travel is the bare minimum we can do for those who've chosen to serve our nation. In the wake of Dobbs, the Department of Defense recognized that abortion is a time-sensitive procedure and access should not be delayed for members or military families. They moved swiftly to ensure service women living in highly restrictive states could travel to another state to receive the health care they need. This policy has come under attack by Senator Tommy Tuberville, who's obstructing hundreds of military promotions and appointments and threatening our national security to push his personal agenda on our service women. That's why it's essential we codify this critical travel policy to ensure the best health care outcomes for our service members and ensure their rights are protected. I want to thank Representative Crow for championing this effort and for his tireless efforts on behalf of our service members and military families. The denial of leave for an abortion or any other reproductive health service violates the rights of members of the armed forces. Which brings me to my next amendment and the dangerous tactics Senator Tuberville has taken to push his personal beliefs on the millions of service women and their families nationwide. For the first time since 1859, we don't have a commandant of the Marine Corps. Senator Tuberville's personal political agenda leaves the Marine Corps without a leader and jeopardizes our national security. For the first time in 59 years, on the brink of welcoming the first female superintendent, the transition did not occur this summer at the United States Naval Academy. Senator Tuberville's crusade has to end. We need to know the true impact of this obstruction, which is why I'm introducing this amendment to analyze the impact these holds are having on our armed forces. Both of these amendments, numbers 971 and 490, are crucial to the future of armed forces and the well-being of our service members. I urge you to find them in order. I also want to share with the committee my support for Amendment 593, the Equal Act, which works to eliminate federal sentencing disparities between crack and powder cocaine. Last Congress, this common sense reform gained broad bipartisan support. I urge the committee to allow for its consideration by the House as part of the NDAA. As the former Outreach and Reentry Coordinator at the U.S. Attorney's Office in New Jersey, I saw firsthand how disparities between crack and cocaine sentencing guidelines unfairly target communities of color. I'm introducing the Equal Act Amendment to eliminate this disparity once and for all. Our nation was built on the principles of equality and justice for all. With this legislation, we can end one of the most race-targeted disparities in the sentencing guidelines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thanks, the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this year, I'm offering seven amendments to H.R. 2670, the National Defense Authorization Act. The topics of these amendments range from job creation and national security to veteran benefits. These amendments will greatly benefit service members and civilian Americans alike, and I strongly urge you to make them in order. <coughs> Amendment number 1519 directs the Secretary of Defense to issue a report on the effects of limiting domestic iron and steel production on our defense supply chains, along with the risks of relying on foreign actors. Amendment number 1520 ensures that we have a reliable source of steel for our defense needs. My district has won world wars for the United States due to our vast natural resources. Right now, the Secretary of Interior has taken steps to ban taconite and critical mineral development in my district. This amendment would prohibit the Secretary of the Interior from issuing such a withdrawal if the Secretary of Defense finds it would harm the defense supply chain. Amendment 1522 reverses a recent mineral withdrawal in my district which threatens our national security by furthering our reliance on foreign rivals. America is import reliant on the raw materials we need for everything from fighter jet tracking systems to equipment for our troops. Amendment number 453 will require the government to pay small business contractors at least half of cost incurred from a change order. 
By eliminating the unexpected financial burdens of small contractors, we will see more small businesses competing for federal contracts and more economic prosperity in our communities. Amendment 1515, it will eliminate the enrollment fees for TRICARE select service members who retired before January 1st of 2018 and cap the enrollment fee for those who retire afterwards. As a reminder, it was Congress who snuck in a provision to the FY 2017 NDEA to create these new enrollment fees and place a financial burden on our service members who have sacrificed so much for our country. This amendment will right this wrong. Amendment 1516 will allow the Navy to solicit contacts from non-home home port shipyards for maintenance work should the shipyards meet the Navy's requirement for ship repair work. It is well past time to give the Navy the authority it needs to reduce its maintenance backlog and better address our military readiness. I know the shipyards in the Great Lakes stand ready, able, and willing to serve. And finally, Mr. Chair, I'm offering amendment number 581. During the last week of June, Minnesota lost the lives of two young men in the cold and rough waters of Lake Superior. This is an absolute tragedy. I am grateful to our United States Coast Guard service members who responded to the call for service. However, as staffing and resources continue to be stretched thin for the Coast Guard, I am deeply, deeply concerned with the vulnerabilities facing our Great Lakes communities. Rural America relies on the life-saving work of the Coast Guard just as anywhere else. The federal government must make the proper investments in our, in our rural Coast Guard stations so we can avoid tragedies to the best of our ability. Every second counts. Amendment 581 will require the Coast Guard to identify vulnerabilities left by closing down the Coast Guard station North Superior in Grand Marais, Minnesota. It will identify staffing and resource challenges the Great Lakes regions, in the Great Lakes regions rather, and the impact on response times to calls for service. It will also require the Coast Guard to create a roadmap to address the vulnerabilities and challenges identified in that report. Mr. Chair, I ask all my amendments be made in order, and I yield back. Yield yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentleman. We will recognize the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Me Member McGovern. Members, my amendment would require the Navy to establish a budget subactivity group for Navy contracted adversary air. Amendment 1070 uses contract air services <coughs> using highly trained former fighter pilots in contractor-owned fighters uh, to train pilots, active duty pilots, in the art of air combat maneuvers, otherwise known as dogfighting, and in other services for ship services to simulate uh, uh, high-speed, low-altitude missiles and things like that. The Air Force and Navy contract for jets and pilots to be the adversaries in, these combat air, in this combat air training. This arrangement is less expensive for the taxpayer while providing for high-quality training for our pilots, using uh, experienced former fighter pilots with thousands of hours most of them patch wearers from uh, Top Gun and uh, Air Force Fighter Weapons School. This amendment is modeled after the Air Force, Air Force budget, uh, which, quite frankly, they do a much better than the Navy at des designating and protecting their adversary air funding. The Air Force adver ter adversary air funding falls under subactivity group 11D in the Air Force's operations and maintenance. Currently, Navy adversary air is lumped into one expenditure line from which other items are expended. Funding intended for adversary air can be moved around by the air boss and spent on something else without triggering reprogramming. So my amendment uh, requires a separate budget of subaccount for Navy contracted adversary air, and it won't add any more to the budget. It adds transparency, transparency and accountability to the Navy and actually improves uh, training for our lethality. The Navy's establishing a budget subactivity group for Navy contracted adversary air will be the most effective means to ensure the Navy makes the most robust use of contracted adversary air. I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of this amendment, Air Force veterans Mr. Pfluger of Texas, Mr. Bacon of Nebraska, Stewart of Utah, as well as my fellow member of the U.S. Naval Academy Board of Visitors, Mr. Whitman of Virginia, Chairman Cole, Ranking Member McGovern, and others. I'd ask for your support for the amendment and make an order so the entire House can take it under consideration. Thank you for your time. I yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Uh, Chair, recognizes the gentlelady from Texas. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the entire committee. Um, as well as the ranking member for your willingness to have members testify on the over 1,500 amendments that were submitted. I also want to thank your staff for their work sorting through all of these. Finally, I want to thank the dozens of members 
from both sides of the aisle who stood up alongside me to co-sponsor my amendments, number 922 and number 607. I want to start with Amendment 922, which would direct the Secretary of Defense to provide additional employment flexibility for military spouses employed at the Department of Defense who have to relocate because their spouse is a member of the armed forces and they receive a permanent change of station order. Right now, if you are married to someone in the armed forces and they receive orders to ship out, you are expected to completely change your employment status on a moment's notice as you move halfway across the country or even across the world. It should come as no surprise then that many of these military spouses are unable to keep their current employment and have difficulty finding new employment. This is an insult to the dignity of these family members, of our service members who are often highly effective in their jobs at the DOD. It is also a threat to our national security. Nearly a third of service members cite as a reason they leave the service is the fact that their spouse faces employment challenges. We cannot claim to be fully supporting our troops if we're not fully supporting their families. This is why my amendment 922 is supported by 27 other members, including over half a dozen majority members from the House Armed Services Committee and over half a dozen veterans. Today, I am following up on a bipartisan letter signed by over 40 members of the House calling on the executive branch to do more for our military spouses. We as Congress have the power, have the obligation to listen to the voices of our constituents and ensure our national security by passing my amendment 922. This amendment is bipartisan. It is co-sponsored by almost a dozen members from the Committee of Jurisdiction. It is germane. It does not score. That is why I humbly request the committee make Amendment 922 in order and allow the House to vote to support our military spouses and bolster our national security. And really briefly on this specifically is the idea. My mom has worked for DOD in and out, and she's worked in HR. And it, it presents a security risk for two reasons. Number one, we have highly trained spouses that are working for DOD, and now when they end up leaving their jobs, now we've got to find more people to replace them. And we also know that right now, I don't really care what industry we're talking about, we're talking about the fact that there's a workforce shortage. And so this would ensure continuity um, amongst the spouses as far as our security is concerned, and it obviously would be very supportive of our service members themselves, and hopefully, um, have many more of them saying, you know what, this will definitely keep my spouse happy so we can stay married, number one. And number two, um, you know, a lot of these service members don't want to have to choose between their family or their service to the country. They want to be able to do both, and I think that this would allow that. My next amendment um, is Amendment 607. As we all know, over the last few years, there has been a, an uptick in fentanyl in this country which has led to a precipitous rise in overdoses and deaths for children and adults. In 2021 alone, the CDC reported that more than 71,000 people overdosed, um, and they were over 71,000 of the overdoses were attributed to synthetic opioids like fentanyl. Fentanyl can be up to 50 times more potent than heroin and 100 times more potent than morphine. What makes fentanyl so dangerous, in addition to its chemical compound, is the fact that fentanyl is odorless, tasteless, and colorless. This means that it is, in many ways, extremely difficult to de detect. If there was one issue that Republicans and Democrats alike should work together on, it should be using and implementing all tools in our federal toolkit to identify and remove fentanyl and fentanyl-laced substances from the hands of our families, communities, service academies, and military installations. Amendment 607 would require fentanyl testing equipment, including fentanyl test strips, be made available on all military installations and at all service academies. Testing equipment, including fentanyl test strips, are proven tools that have helped to identify fentanyl and fentanyl-laced drugs and prevent avoidable deaths and overdoses from occurring. Efforts to increase access to these types of tools have been praised across all states and have received bipartisan support in the past. This amendment is no exception. Amendment 607 has bipartisan support from 14 members representing all regions across the United States. If we are serious about preventing the deaths of children, family members, service members, and cadets, 
then it is vital that we ensure that this testing equipment is available on these installations and at service academies across the country. I urge members of the Rules Committee to make these amendments in order. Thank you for your time. And the last thing that I'll add is that someone, I am someone who practiced criminal defense. And unfortunately, I have seen drug abuse across the gambit. And while we have so many laws in place that will absolutely lock up someone who is a drug dealer, and obviously we need to do that, at the same time, we have to recognize that there is a demand for these drugs, a demand that is rooted in um, the illness of, of addiction. And if we want to save lives, we can lock one up at a time, and that's great, but that's still not necessarily removing these drugs off the streets. And right now, I don't think that it has to be an either or. I think that it can be an and. I think we can absolutely save lives, and this would be a great start by making sure that those people that are suffering from addiction actually have access to knowing what it is that they are using so that they can make a decision, and hopefully that can be a life-saving decision. And so with that, I yield back. The lady yields back. Um, I have no questions. Thank you all for your very thorough presentations. Uh, the gentlelady from New Mexico. I have no specific questions either, other than to note that so many of the amendments really talked about quality of life, whether that was making sure that people have the ability to get the health care they need, that women have the ability to get the health care they need. To, I, I believe, uh, our fastest speaking uh, congress, uh, congressman uh, uh, was in the military because you had to get it all out. Uh, and, but I think that those are so very uh, important, thinking about how do we invest in uh, those who serve, including in trying to save their lives. Uh, so thank you very much for your amendments. Thank you. Gentlelady from Minnesota. Gentleman from New York. Mr. Ranking Member, I'm sorry. I'm okay. Very good. This panel, is, thank you for your testimony. This panel is excused. Well, you just got a new nickname. That's <laughs> <laughs> fast talking out. <laughs> All right. Our next panel, uh, Ms. Dilla Cruz, Mr. Crenshaw, Mr. Grothman, and Mr. Griffith. <clears throat> it's been our habit to go from the from the left to the right, from my left. Putting time limits on us this time? Mr. Grothman, you're recognized. Oh, there we are. Okay. We'll try to go through these quick. The first one I've come with in the past regard uh, aircraft carriers requires the Comptro Comptroller General to conduct a comprehensive study of the fiscal and national security impacts of reducing the active aircraft carrier fleet by one carrier and report the findings to Congress. In part, this stems from a feeling that at the end of World War II, after the Battle of the Midway, already at that time, aircraft carriers were maybe deemed a little bit obsolete. Uh, since that time, we had a war game. Certain people have told me that either a Swedish or French submarine sunk one of our carriers relatively quickly. I realize we have a lot uh, more protection for our carriers than we did in World War II, but I think the, uh, uh, the uh, cap capabilities of things like hypersonic middle missiles uh, also puts our aircraft carriers at more risk. I know in the past this committee has rejected this, I think we have a problem that we're spending an awful lot of money on defense, and we ought to be looking at everywhere, including aircraft carriers. And like I said, you have such big ships, uh, you have such uh, capable of missiles against the ships today, so many capable submarines. I really think we ought to have a study on it. Maybe we can find a huge savings there. Next, Amendment 832 um, requires the Secretary of Defense to ensure that to the extent pract practicable, commercial positions at the Department of Defense be filled by civilian employees or contractors 
rather than members of the armed forces. Um, each position that would shifted would save money. Replacing some military personnel with civilians would reduce the discretionary budget authority by a total of $19.6 billion to the 23 over the um, um, fiscal year 23 to 32 period. Next, Amendment 857 requires the Department of Defense to provide education savings accounts for military families who elect to enroll their kids in local school systems instead of uh, DODEA schools. Um, I uh, can't think of a downside of that. We're doing all we can to get more people to enlist in the military. I think making sure that you have an opportunity to send your kids to better schools if you feel the local schools are better or perhaps private schools are better will only increase the number and quality of people we have volunteering for our military. The uh, DODEA system operates 53 schools in seven states at a cost of about $23,000 per pupil, which is obviously entirely inappropriate. I think in Wisconsin, we're probably sitting around $13,000 per pupil. And I don't think we have uh, uh, low spending schools. Next, Amendment 1079 prohibits the use of funds authorized in the bill from being used to pay any civil service position in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Department of Defense. A lot of people have talked about DEI. I think DEI, the whole concept, is divisive. That's the only reason why people think this thing up. I think America's probably been, uh, well, first of all, it starts with a ridiculous premise that people's um, opinions or what they have to contribute is determined by where their ancestors lived a 1,000 years ago. On the face of it, that's offensive, right? The idea that if my great-grandfather came from Peru. I'm, I don't speak Spanish. I've never been to Peru. But as a result, I can identify as Peruvian and carry something different to a, an organization is preposterous. And of course, America has uh, wildly successful people from all around the world in this country. Wealthiest uh, ethnic group in America today is Indian Americans. Most who came here not even knowing the English language, so I mean, the concept that we have a racial problem in this country is a little bit preposterous. Uh, the only purpose for these bureaucrats that I can see is to create divisiveness um, by, by having people focus on people's, where their DNA was uh, 500 years ago. And uh, next, 1079 prohibits the use of funds, or, or wait, I'm sorry, uh, next, 1538, requires that the Secretary of Defense to submit a report to Congress detailing each foreign manufactured critical component procured by the Department of Defense under this act. Um, I am worried that a significant number, maybe not the final product, but a significant number of components in American uh, military procurement are produced in countries that maybe we couldn't count on in a pinch in the event we were at war. I think we should be aware of uh, which components those are so that Congress can do what we can to encourage more of those components to be manufactured in the United States. There we are. I hope that wasn't too long. No, it's perfect. Chair, thanks the gentleman. The gentleman perfect. from Virginia is now recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here on one issue and three amendments. And those amendments are Amendment 350, which is Rosendale Griffith. Rosendale has already spoken today on his amendment. Uh, and then two Griffith amendments, they all deal with the same problem. Those are numbers 931 and 943. And what the problem is, is that there's language. It's never been used. I even got letters one time from DOJ and, and uh, Department of Defense saying they didn't, they'd never used it. But the technical language says, that somebody can be picked up, an American citizen can be picked up on American soil, and if there's an allegation by the military that they have assisted uh, one of the terrorist organizations, the language says that was connected with 9-11, uh, but we've seen that language used very broadly over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, that they can then be held until the end of the conflict without any of their civil liberties. At one point in time, uh, then Chairman Goodlatte tried to get uh, habeas, uh, uh, habeas corpus added in, Senate took it out. 
It's an, I believe, on its face, an unconstitutional provision that says an American citizen on American soil can be picked up and held without any hearings whatsoever. So uh, Rosendale's amendment takes American citizens completely out of it. My two amendments, one of them uh, puts in uh, knowingly so that there's a scienter requirement, a mens rea, so that you have an obligation to establish at least that they knowingly knew they were assisting a terrorist organization, and the government would at least have to prove that. And 943 just says that uh, it only applies to American citizens. So the first of my amendments that I named would cover everybody, even non-American citizens. The second would cover American citizens and just say they have to knowingly know that the people were engaged in, in activities of terrorism and that they were assisting them for that cause. Uh, it appears, based on the intelligence that I have, that the, co that the underlying committee probably prefers the Rosendale Amendment. I'm fine with that. My problem is, is that because it is so blatantly unconstitutional in its face, I can't vote for the bill without one of these amendments being adopted. I yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentleman, uh, gentlelady from Texas. Uh, thank you, and thank you to all the members of the committee for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'd like to use my time to urge this body to accept my bipartisan amendment that would include the Preventing the Financing of Illegal Synthetic Drugs Act in this year's uh, NDAA. This legislation will direct the Comptroller General of the United States to study the illicit financing associated with synthetic drug trafficking, including fentanyl. According to the CDC, over 107,000 Americans died from drug overdoses or drug poisonings in the 12-month period ending January 2022. 67% of those deaths involved synthetic opioids such as fentanyl, which is up to 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. Last year in Hidalgo County, uh, that sits in my district, Hidalgo County made news with the massive fentanyl seizures at the U.S.-Mexico border. These include 1.5 million in January 2022 and 330,000 in June 2022. These numbers are absolutely staggering. According to the law enforcement, an illicit investment of 30000 or less could yield 6 to $32 million. To end this crisis, we must tackle the financing. As the adage goes, follow the money. Importantly, after I introduced my amendment as a standalone legislation earlier this Congress, uh, designated as H.R. 1076, the Congressional Budget Office determined that this bill would have a uh, negligible impact on the government spending. CBO estimated that it would cost less than 500000 to implement this legislation between 2023 and 2028. This is a small price to pay for going after the drug traffickers who are destroying communities across our country. The Preventing the Financing of the Illegal Synthetic Drugs Act, which passed the House of this Congress on a standalone vote of 402 to 2, will help law enforcement pinpoint the business models of the traffickers, how they move and hide their profits, and what the U.S. can do to stop fentanyl money laundering. The illicit Funds generated from fentanyl trafficking are empowering the operations of the cartels that are poisoning our families and perpetuating a vicious cycle. To end this carnage that is taking so many lives, that has taken so many lives in South Texas and all across America, we must track down the funds that fuel it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and with that, I yield back. Thanks, the gentlelady. The, uh, the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for, for being so patient here. Uh, I'm, I'm really surprised that you guys let members talk as long as they want without any rules. Uh, but good for you, and I appreciate your service uh, for doing that. Uh, I appreciate this panel for uh, being We just succinct. instituted a time limit. Yeah, <laughs> you should, because uh, I will be brief. Um, so, okay, let, let's talk about what the, the issue is and then why I'm even here, because a, a version of this uh, bill did already make it into the base text, but there was a problem here, and that's what I want to talk to you all about today. So the, the underlying bill, uh, worth noting, we've already voted this out uh, in last year's NDAA. It died in, in, in conference uh, with the Senate. 
This is about using psychedelic, uh, or, or studying psychedelic treatments via clinical trials in the Department of Defense. Uh, psychedelic treatments to treat PTSD, to treat TBIs. Uh, it is shown to be very effective. There's a lot of evidence uh, that it is effective. Uh, there have been previous studies, but we need to study it more. We need to understand it uh, so that it can be applied properly to service members who are truly suffering. The, the, the outcomes are unbelievable. Um, there's a lot of support for this bill. Uh, the chairman of, the, of HASC supports it, Chairman Rogers. There's a wide variety of Democrats and Republicans that support it. Um, of course, I support it. Now, why are we here? We're here because in May, I introduced a standalone bill to create this funding and then worked closely with members of the Armed Services Committee. I attended the House Armed Services Committee member day, received very positive feedback. Chairman Rogers supports it. So you'd think that we wouldn't need to be here today because a version of it already made it into the base text of the NDAA. But I said a version, not, not the one I proposed. At the last minute, Committee staff on HASC unilaterally, and without the authorization of the chairman, insisted that changes be made to significantly weaken the bill. They stripped all the funding out of it. They did this the day of the NDAA markup. Changed the language to require just a study, which can be interpreted a number of ways, not a clinical trial, not outlining exactly how this should be done. They stripped all that out before we could get to it, and they managed to make that into the markup. So now we have to be here to, to push for an amendment that, that pushes this, uh, that, that makes this bill whole again, that makes it the same one that we all voted out of, of the NDAA last year together as a house, to make sure that there's $15 million in funding so that this actually happens, and to make sure that, the, that it's specific that it is uh, specifically indicated that clinical trials be used so that we can truly understand these therapies and save the lives of veterans. And I truly mean that, save the lives. I have countless testimonies where veterans were completely hopeless. They were on 25 different types of pills a day, multiple suicide attempts, veterans and service members, active duty, and did one day of this treatment and were cured. Cured of their drug addiction, cured of their PTSD, cured of the inner demons that haunt them. This is a really amazing stuff that we have to study and, and, and put the work towards. So I urge you to please um, make this in order, and then we'll vote it out of the House, and I yield back, pending your questions. Thank you. Sure, thanks, the gentleman from Texas. Um, Mr. Griffith, let me just ask you if I could, because I admire your tenacity. You, you... <laughs> You've been after this for as long as you've been here. Yes. Um, what what is the what's the restriction that doesn't allow you to be successful? What, where is the where's the breakdown here? It's always been a mystery, and sometimes it's been that they didn't want to open up that section of the of the code to possible other uh, amendments. There, there's just always been a hesitation, and part of it is because it's never been used. It hasn't seemed that it was, you know, that it was timely or ripe, or there were lots of other more important things. Uh, unfortunately, um, I think that you shouldn't leave something on the books that's that that's that out of whack with our principles, uh, and that it should be corrected and we get it right on the books. And I'm not saying that you don't take that you take away that provision completely. I'm just saying, an American citizen, and particularly on American soil. Now, the, the Rosendale Amendment just says any American citizen. But my feeling has always been an American citizen on American soil ought not to have the military have the right to say, we think you assisted a uh, terrorist organization, therefore we're going to hold you in custody indefinitely or until the conflict is over. Well, as you know, this conflict's been going on since the uh, AUMFs of 01 and 02. Now, it's never been used, and that's, that's to be a compliment to our justice and DOD folks. But why have it on the books when it's not being used, it doesn't appear to something they need, a tool they need, and it's blatantly unconstitutional. So I, I, I can give you my examples that I've always given about the, the man who unwittingly gives the neighbor a ride to the courthouse, uh, not knowing that the giant briefcase he carries, which I used to carry when I was practicing law, contains a, an explosion, uh, a, a, an incendiary device of some sort. And then they're held, and they really have no actual knowledge that their neighbor, who they met maybe once at a community picnic, was a part of al-Qaeda or ISIS or the Taliban. And I just think it's uh, abhorrent and needs to be pulled out. And 
it is just on its face blatantly unconstitutional. So refresh my memory. You've brought this amendment. I've brought various versions of this over the years, trying to answer uh, concerns by various staffers. It, it appears now that the Rosendale Amendment is uh, the most favored, and I think that's great. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, I just want the problem fixed. And so if it's the Rosendale, I did get my name added onto it, so it's now Rosendale Griffith, but if the Rosendale Griffith Amendment is the one y'all want to send to the floor, I'm thrilled. I'm just thrilled to get a chance to maybe finally fix this problem uh, once and for all and uh, I admire move your forward. tenacity. I have no other questions. Uh, thank you, member. Thank you. I, I, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm associating myself with Mr. Bur Dr. Burgess and uh, his remarks on your amendment. But, uh, uh, but I, uh, hopefully it, it, some, one of the versions will be made in order. And Mr. Crenshaw, for what it's worth, I agree with you on that. And so hopefully we will be able to make yours in order. And I thank you all for being here. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Minnesota. And the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. The gentleman from New York. And the gentlelady from New Mexico. Well, thank you all. Appreciate well, it. Yeah, thank you for your indulgence. You, uh, it's been a long day, so thank you. Mr. Chair, yes, thank you. Mr. Chair, um, can I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record statements from Representatives Linda Sanchez, Lou Correa, and Massey Captor? Without objection, so ordered. Is there anyone else seeking to testify in H.R. 2670? Seeing no one, this closes the hearing portion. And without objection, the committee stands in recess subject to the call of the Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, do you have any idea what time we might be coming back? I do, but I can't tell you. You what? Okay. Will it be before midnight or? Okay. 